Chapter 25 The General Law of Capitalist Accumulation Section 1 A growing demand for labor power accompanies accumulation if the composition of capital remains the same. In this chapter, we shall consider the influence of the growth of capital on the fate of the working class. The most important factor in this investigation is the composition of capital and the changes it undergoes in the course of the process of accumulation. The composition of capital is to be understood in a twofold sense. As value, it is determined by the proportion in which it is divided into constant capital, or the value of the means of production, and variable capital, or the value of labor power, that is, the sum total of wages. As material, as it functions in the process of production, all capital is divided into means of production and living labor power. This latter composition is determined by the relation between the mass of the means of production employed on the one hand and the mass of the labor necessary for their employment on the other. I call the former the value composition, the latter the technical composition of capital. There is a close correlation between the two. To express this, I call the value composition of capital, insofar as it is determined by its technical composition and mirrors the changes in the latter, the organic composition of capital. Whenever I refer to the composition of capital without further qualification, its organic composition is always understood. The many individual capitals invested in a particular branch of production have compositions which differ from each other to a greater or lesser extent. The average of their individual compositions gives us the composition of the total capital in the branch of production under consideration. Finally, the average of all the average compositions in all branches of production gives us the composition of the total social capital of a country, and it is with this alone that we are concerned here in the final analysis. Growth of capital implies growth of its variable constituent, in other words, the part invested in labor power. A part of the surplus value which has been transformed into additional capital must always be retransformed into variable capital, or additional labor fund. If we assume that while all other circumstances remain the same, the composition of capital also remains constant, i.e. a definite mass of the means of production continues to need the same mass of labor power to set it in motion, then the demand for labor and the fund for the subsistence of the workers both clearly increase in the same proportion as the capital and with the same rapidity. Since the capital produces a surplus value every year, of which one part is added every year to the original capital, since this increment itself grows every year, along with the augmentation of the capital already functioning, and since, lastly, under conditions especially liable to stimulate the drive for self-enrichment, such as the opening of new markets or of new spheres for the outlay of capital resulting from newly developed social requirements, the scale of accumulation may suddenly be extended merely by a change in the proportion in which the surplus value or the surplus product, is divided into capital and revenue. For all these reasons, the requirements of accumulating capital may exceed the growth in labor power or in the number of workers. The demand for workers may outstrip the supply, and thus wages may rise. This must indeed ultimately be the case if the conditions assumed above continue to prevail. For since in each year more workers are employed than in the preceding year, sooner or later a point must be reached at which the requirements of accumulation begin to outgrow the customary supply of labor, and a rise in wages therefore takes place. Complaints were to be heard about this in England during the whole of the 15th century and the first half of the 18th. The more or less favorable circumstances in which the wage laborers support and multiply themselves in no way alter the fundamental character of capitalist production, as simple reproduction constantly reproduces the capital relation itself, i.e. the presence of capitalists on the one side and wage laborers on the other side, so reproduction on an expanded scale, i.e. accumulation, reproduces the capital relation on an expanded scale, with more capitalists or bigger capitalists at one pole and more wage laborers at the other pole. The reproduction of labor power, which must incessantly be reincorporated into capital as its means of valorization, which cannot get free of capital, and whose enslavement to capital is only concealed by the variety of individual capitalists to whom it sells itself, forms, in fact, a factor in the reproduction of capital itself. Accumulation of capital is, therefore, multiplication of the proletariat. Classical political economy understood this fact so thoroughly that Adam Smith, Ricardo, etc., as mentioned earlier, inaccurately identified accumulation with the consumption by productive workers of the whole of the capitalized part of the surplus product, or with the transformation of the surplus product into additional wage laborers.
John Bellers was already saying this in 1696, quote, For if one had a hundred thousand acres of land, and as many pounds in money, and as many cattle, without a laborer, what would the rich man be but a laborer? And as the laborers make men rich, so the more laborers there will be, the more rich men, the labor of the poor being the minds of the rich. So also Bernard de Mandeville at the beginning of the 18th century, quote, It would be easier, where property is well secured, to live without money than without poor. For who would do the work? As they, the poor, ought to be kept from starving, so they should receive nothing worth saving. If here and there one of the lowest class, by uncommon industry and pinching his belly, lifts himself above the condition he was brought up in, nobody ought to hinder him. Nay, it is undeniably the wisest course for every person in the society, and for every private family, to be frugal. But it is the interest of all rich nations that the greatest part of the poor should almost never be idle, and yet continually spend what they get. Those that get their living by their daily labor have nothing to stir them up to be serviceable but their wants, which it is prudence to relieve, but folly to cure. The only thing, then, that can render the laboring man industrious is a moderate quantity of money, for as too little will, according as his temper is, either dispirit or make him desperate, so too much will make him insolent and lazy. From what has been said, it is manifest that in a free nation, where slaves are not allowed of, the surest wealth consists in a multitude of laborious poor, for besides that, they are the never-failing nursery of fleets and armies. Without them, there could be no enjoyment, and no product of any country could be valuable. To make the society, which of course consists of non-workers, happy and people easier under the meanest circumstances, it is requisite that great numbers of them should be ignorant as well as poor. Knowledge both enlarges and multiplies our desires, and the fewer things a man wishes for, the more easily his necessities may be supplied. What Mandeville, an honest man with a clear mind, had not yet grasped, was the fact that the mechanism of the accumulation process itself not only increases the amount of capital, but also the mass of the laboring poor, i.e. the wage laborers, who turn their labor power into a force for increasing the valorization of the growing capital, and who are thereby compelled to make the relation of dependence on their own product, as personified in the capitalist, into an eternal relation. In reference to this relation of dependence, Sir F. M. Eden remarks in his The State of the Poor, or A History of the Laboring Classes in England, quote, The natural produce of our soil is certainly not fully adequate to our subsistence. We can neither be clothed, lodged, nor fed, but in consequence of some previous labor. A portion, at least, of the society must be indefatigably employed. There are others who, though they neither toil nor spin, can yet command the produce of industry, but who owe their exemption from labor solely to civilization and order. They are peculiarly the creatures of civil institutions, which have recognized that individuals may acquire property by various other means besides the exertion of labor. Persons of independent fortune owe their superior advantages by no means to any superior abilities of their own, but almost entirely to the industry of others. It is not the possession of land or of money, but the command of labor which distinguishes the opulent from the laboring part of the community. This, meaning the scheme approved by Eden, would give the people of property sufficient influence and authority over those who work for them, and it would place such laborers not in an abject or servile condition, but in such a state of easy and liberal dependence as all who know human nature and its history will allow to be necessary for their own comfort. Sir F. M. Eden, it may be remarked in passing, was the only disciple of Adam Smith to have achieved anything of importance during the 18th century. Under the conditions of accumulation we have assumed so far, conditions which are the most favorable to the workers, their relation of dependence on capital takes on forms which are endurable, or as Eden says, easy and liberal. Instead of becoming more intensive with the growth of capital, this relation of dependence only becomes more extensive, i.e. the sphere of capital's exploitation and domination merely extends its own dimensions and the number of people subjected to it. A larger part of the worker's own surplus product, which is always increasing and is continually being transformed into additional capital, comes back to them in the shape of means of payment, so that they can extend the circle of their enjoyments, make additions to their consumption fund of clothes, furniture, etc., and lay by a small reserve fund of money. But these things no more abolish the exploitation of the wage laborer and his situation of dependence than do better clothing, food, and treatment, and a larger peculium in the case of a slave. 
A rise in the price of labor as a consequence of the accumulation of capital only means, in fact, that the length and weight of the golden chain the wage laborer has already forged for himself allow it to be loosened somewhat. In the controversies on this question, the essential fact has generally been overlooked, namely the differentia specifica of capitalist production. Labor power is not purchased under this system for the purpose of satisfying the personal needs of the buyer, either by its service or through its product. The aim of the buyer is the valorization of his capital, the production of commodities which contain more labor than he paid for, and therefore contain a portion of value which costs him nothing, and is nevertheless realized through the sale of those commodities. The production of surplus value, or the making of profits, is the absolute law of this mode of production. Labor power can be sold only to the extent that it preserves and maintains the means of production as capital, reproduces its own value as capital, and provides a source of additional capital in the shape of unpaid labor. The conditions of its sale, whether more or less favorable to the worker, include, therefore, the necessity of its constant resale and the constantly extended reproduction of wealth as capital. Wages, as we have seen, imply by their very nature that the worker will always provide a certain quantity of unpaid labor. Even if we leave aside the case where a rise of wages is accompanied by a fall in the price of labor, it is clear that at the best of times, an increase in wages means only a quantitative reduction in the amount of unpaid labor the worker has to supply. This reduction can never go so far as to threaten the system itself. Apart from the violent conflicts over the rate of wages, and Adam Smith already showed that in such a conflict the master, by and large, remained the master, a rise in the price of labor resulting from accumulation of capital implies the following alternatives. Either the price of labor keeps on rising because its rise does not interfere with the progress of accumulation. There is nothing remarkable in this, for as Adam Smith says, quote, after profits are diminished, stock may not only continue to increase, but increase much faster than before. A great stock, though with small profits, generally increases faster than a small stock with great profits. In this case, it is evident that a reduction in the amount of unpaid labor in no way interferes with the extension of the domain of capital. Or, the other alternative, accumulation slackens as a result of the rise in the price of labor, because the stimulus of gain is blunted. The rate of accumulation lessens, but this means that the primary cause of that lessening itself vanishes, i.e. the disproportion between capital and exploitable labor power. The mechanism of the capitalist production process removes the very obstacles it temporarily creates. The price of labor falls again to a level corresponding with capital's requirements for self-valorization, whether this level is below, the same as, or above that which was normal before the rise of wages took place. We see, therefore, that in the first case, it was not the diminished rate, either of the absolute or of the proportional increase in labor power or the working population which caused the excess quantity of capital, but rather the converse. The increase in capital made the exploitable labor power insufficient. In the second case, it was not the increased rate either of the absolute or of the proportional increase in labor power or the working population that made the capital insufficient, but rather the converse. The relative reduction in the amount of capital caused the exploitable labor power, or rather its price, to be in excess. It is these absolute movements of the accumulation of capital which are reflected as relative movements of the mass of exploitable labor power, and therefore seem produced by the latter's own independent movement. To put it mathematically, the rate of accumulation is the independent, not the dependent variable. The rate of wages is the dependent, not the independent variable. Thus, when the industrial cycle is in its phase of crisis, a general fall in the prices of commodities is expressed as a rise in the relative value of money, and in the phase of prosperity, a general rise in the price of commodities is expressed as a fall in the relative value of money. The so-called currency school conclude from this that with high prices too much money is in circulation, with low prices too little. Their ignorance and complete misunderstanding of the facts are worthily paralleled by the economists who interpret the above phenomena of accumulation by saying in the one case there are too few and in the other too many wage laborers in existence. The law of capitalist production, which really lies at the basis of the supposed natural law of population, can be reduced simply to this, 
The relation between capital, accumulation, and the rate of wages is nothing other than the relation between the unpaid labor which has been transformed into capital and the additional paid labor necessary to set in motion this additional capital. It is therefore in no way a relation between two magnitudes which are mutually independent, i.e. between the magnitude of the capital and the numbers of the working population. It is rather, at bottom, only the relation between the unpaid and the paid labor of the same working population. If the quantity of unpaid labor supplied by the working class and accumulated by the capitalist class increases so rapidly that its transformation into capital requires an extraordinary addition of paid labor, then wages rise, and all other circumstances remaining equal, the unpaid labor diminishes in proportion. But as soon as this diminution touches the point at which the surplus labor that nourishes capital is no longer supplied in normal quantity, a reaction sets in. A smaller part of revenue is capitalized, accumulation slows down, and the rising movement of wages comes against an obstacle. The rise of wages is therefore confined within limits that not only leave intact the foundations of the capitalist system, but also secure its reproduction on an increasing scale. The law of capitalist accumulation, mystified by the economist into a supposed law of nature, in fact expresses the situation that the very nature of accumulation excludes every diminution in the degree of exploitation of labor and every rise in the price of labor which could seriously imperil the continual reproduction on an ever larger scale of the capital relation. It cannot be otherwise in a mode of production in which the worker exists to satisfy the need of the existing values for valorization, as opposed to the inverse situation, in which object of wealth is there to satisfy the worker's own need for development. Just as man is governed in religion by the products of his own brain, so in capitalist production he is governed by the products of his own hand. Section 2 a relative diminution of the variable part of capital occurs in the course of the further progress of accumulation and of the concentration accompanying it. According to the economists themselves, it is neither the actual extent of social wealth nor the magnitude of the capital already acquired that leads to a rise of wages, but only the constant growth of accumulation and the degree of rapidity of that growth. So far, we have considered only one special phase of this process that in which the increase of capital occurs while the technical composition of capital remains constant, but the process goes beyond this phase. Given the general basis of the capitalist system, a point is reached in the course of accumulation at which the development of the productivity of social labor becomes the most powerful lever of accumulation. This same cause, says Adam Smith, which raises the wages of labor, the increase of stock, tends to increase its productive powers and to make a smaller quantity of labor produce a greater quantity of work. Apart from natural conditions, such as the fertility of the soil, etc., and apart from the skill of independent and isolated producers, shown rather qualitatively in the high standard of their products than quantitatively in their mass, the level of the social productivity of labor is expressed in the relative extent of the means of production that one worker, during a given time, with the same degree of intensity of labor power, turns into products. The mass of means of production with which he functions in this way increases with the productivity of his labor. But those means of production play a double role. The increase of some is a consequence, that of others is a condition of the increasing productivity of labor. For example, the consequence of the division of labor under manufacture and the application of machinery is that more raw material is worked up in the same time, and therefore a greater mass of raw material and auxiliary substances enters into the labor process. That is the consequence of the increasing productivity of labor. On the other hand, the mass of machinery, beasts of burden, mineral manures, drain pipes, etc., is a condition of the increasing productivity of labor. This is also true of the means of production concentrated in buildings, furnaces, means of transport, etc. But whether condition or consequence, the growing extent of the means of production as compared with the labor power incorporated in them is an expression of the growing productivity of labor. The increase of the latter appears, therefore, in the diminution of the mass of labor in proportion to the mass of means of production moved by it, or in the diminution of the subjective factor of the labor process as compared with the objective factor. This change in the technical composition of capital, this growth in the mass of the means of production, as compared with the mass of labor power that vivifies them, is reflected in its value composition by the increase of the constant constituent of capital at the expense of its variable constituent, 
There may be, for example, originally 50% of a capital laid out in means of production and 50% in labor power. Later on, with the development of the productivity of labor, 80% may be laid out in means of production and 20% in labor power, and so on. This law of the progressive growth of the constant part of capital, in comparison with the variable part, is confirmed at every step, as already shown, by the comparative analysis of the prices of commodities, whether we compare different economic epochs or different nations in the same epoch. The relative magnitude of the part of the price which represents the value of the means of production, or the constant part of the capital, is in direct proportion to the progress of accumulation, whereas the relative magnitude of the other part of the price, which represents the variable part of the capital, or the payment made for labor, is in inverse proportion to the progress of accumulation. However, this diminution in the variable part of capital, as compared with the constant part, or in other words, this change in the composition of the value of the capital, provides only an approximate indication of the change in the composition of its material constituents. The value of the capital employed today in spinning is, say, 7 eighths constant and 1 eighth variable, while at the beginning of the 18th century, it was 1 half constant and 1 half variable. Yet in contrast to this, the mass of raw material, instruments of labor, etc., that a certain quantity of spinning labor consumes productively today is many hundred times greater than at the beginning of the 18th century. The reason is simple. With the increasing productivity of labor, the mass of the means of production consumed by labor increases, but their value, in comparison with their mass, diminishes. Their value, therefore, rises absolutely, but not in proportion to the increase in their mass. The increase of the difference between constant and variable capital is therefore much less than that of the difference between the mass of the means of production into which the constant capital and the mass of the labor power into which the variable capital is converted. The former difference increases with the latter, but in a smaller degree. The progress of accumulation lessens the relative magnitude of the variable part of capital, therefore, but this by no means thereby excludes the possibility of a rise in its absolute magnitude. Suppose that a capital value is divided at first into 50% constant and 50% variable capital, and later into 80% constant and 20% variable capital. If, in the meantime, the original capital, say 6,000 pounds, has increased 18,000 pounds, its variable constituent has also increased, in fact, by 20%. It was 3,000 pounds, it is now 3,600 pounds. But whereas formerly an increase of capital by 20% would have sufficed to raise the demand for labor by 20%, now the original capital needs to be tripled in order to secure an increase of 20% in the demand for labor. We showed in Part 4 how the development of the social productivity of labor presupposes cooperation on a large scale, how the division and combination of labor can only be organized on that basis and the means of production economized by concentration on a vast scale, how instruments of labor which by their very nature can only be used in common, such as systems of machinery, can be called into existence, how gigantic natural forces can be pressed into the service of production, and how the production process can be transformed into a process of the technological application of scientific knowledge. When the prevailing system is the production of commodities, i.e. where the means of production are the property of private persons, and the artisan therefore either produces commodities in isolation and independently of other people, or sells his labor power as a commodity because he lacks the means to produce independently, the above-mentioned presupposition, namely cooperation on a large scale, can be realized only through the increase of individual capitals, only in proportion as the social means of production and subsistence are transformed into the private property of capitalists. Where the basis is the production of commodities, large-scale production can occur only in a capitalist form. A certain accumulation of capital in the hands of individual producers, therefore, forms the necessary precondition for a specifically capitalist mode of production. We had, therefore, to presuppose this when dealing with the transition from handicrafts to capitalist industry. It may be called primitive accumulation, because it is the historical basis instead of the historical result of specifically capitalist production. How it itself originates we need not investigate as yet. It is enough that it forms the starting point. But all methods for raising the social productivity of labor that grow up on this basis are at the same time methods for the increased production of surplus value or surplus product, which is, in its turn, the formative element of accumulation. They are, therefore, also methods for the production of capital by capital, or methods for its accelerated accumulation. The continual reconversion of surplus value into capital now appears in the shape of the increasing magnitude of the capital that enters into the production process. This is, in turn, the basis of an extended scale of production, of the methods for raising the productivity of labor that accompany it, and of an accelerated production of surplus value, 
if therefore a certain degree of accumulation of capital appears as a precondition for the specifically capitalist mode of production, the latter reacts back to cause an accelerated accumulation of capital. With the accumulation of capital, therefore, the specifically capitalist mode of production develops, and with the capitalist mode of production, the accumulation of capital. These two economic factors bring about, in the compound ratio of the impulses they give to each other, that change in the technical composition of capital by which the variable component becomes smaller and smaller as compared with the constant component. Every individual capital is a larger or smaller concentration of means of production with a corresponding command over a larger or smaller army of workers. Every accumulation becomes the means of new accumulation. With the increasing mass of wealth which functions as capital, accumulation increases the concentration of that wealth in the hands of individual capitalists, and thereby widens the basis of production on a large scale and extends the specifically capitalist methods of production. The growth of the social capital is accomplished through the growth of many individual capitals. All other circumstances remaining the same, the individual capitals grow, and with their growth, the concentration of the means of production increases, in the proportion in which they form aliquot parts of the total social capital. At the same time, offshoots split off from the original capitals and start to function as new and independent capitals. Apart from other causes, the division of property within capitalist families plays a great part in this. With the accumulation of capital, therefore, the number of capitalists grows to a greater or lesser extent. Two features characterize this kind of concentration, which grows directly out of accumulation, or rather, is identical with it. Firstly, the increasing concentration of the social means of production in the hands of individual capitalists is, other things remaining equal, limited by the degree of increase of social wealth. Secondly, the part of the social capital domiciled in each particular sphere of production is divided among many capitalists who confront each other as mutually independent and competitive commodity producers. Therefore, not only are accumulation and the concentration accompanying it scattered over many points, but the increase of each functioning capital is thwarted by the formation of new capitals and the subdivision of old. Accumulation, therefore, presents itself on the one hand as an increasing concentration of the means of production and of command over labor, and on the other hand, as repulsion of many individual capitals from one another. This fragmentation of the total social capital into many individual capitals, or the repulsion of its fractions from each other, is counteracted by their attraction. The attraction of capitals no longer means the simple concentration of the means of production and the command over labor, which is identical with accumulation. It is concentration of capitals already formed, destruction of their individual independence, expropriation of capitalist by capitalist, transformation of many small into few large capitals. This process differs from the first one in this respect, that it only presupposes a change in the distribution of already available and already functioning capital. Its field of action is therefore not limited by the absolute growth of social wealth, or in other words, by the absolute limits of accumulation. Capital grows to a huge mass in a single hand in one place, because it has been lost by many in another place. This is centralization proper, as distinct from accumulation and concentration. The laws of this centralization of capitals, or of the attraction of capital by capital, cannot be developed here. A few brief factual indications must suffice. The battle of competition is fought by the cheapening of commodities. The cheapness of commodities depends, all other circumstances remaining the same, on the productivity of labor, and this depends in turn on the scale of production. Therefore, the larger capitals beat the smaller. It'll further be remembered that, with the development of the capitalist mode of production, there is an increase in the minimum amount of individual capital necessary to carry on a business under its normal conditions. The smaller capitals, therefore, crowd into spheres of production which large-scale industry has taken control of only sporadically or incompletely. Here, competition rages in direct proportion to the number and in inverse proportion to the magnitude of the rival capitals. It always ends in the ruin of many small capitalists whose capitals partly pass into the hands of their conquerors and partly vanish completely. Apart from this, an altogether new force comes into existence with the development of capitalist production the credit system. In its first stages, this system furtively creeps in as the humble assistant of accumulation, drawing into the hands of individual or associated capitalists by invisible threads the money resources, which lie scattered in larger or smaller amounts over the surface of society. But it soon becomes a new and terrible weapon in the battle of competition, and is finally transformed into an enormous social mechanism for the centralization of capitals.
Commensurately with the development of capitalist production and accumulation, there also takes place the development of the two most powerful levers of centralization, competition and credit. At the same time, the progress of accumulation increases the material amenable to centralization, i.e. the individual capitals, while the expansion of capitalist production creates on the one hand the social need and on the other the technical means for those immense industrial undertakings which require a previous centralization of capital for their accomplishment. Today, therefore, the force of attraction which draws together individual capitals and the tendency to centralization are both stronger than ever before. But if the relative extension and energy of the movement towards centralization is determined to a certain degree by the magnitude of capitalist wealth and the superiority of the economic mechanism already attained, the advance of centralization does not depend in any way on a positive growth in the magnitude of social capital. And this is what distinguishes centralization from concentration, the latter being only another name for reproduction on an extended scale. Centralization may result from a mere change in the distribution of already existing capitals, from a simple alteration in the quantitative grouping of the component parts of social capital. Capital can grow into powerful masses in a single hand in one place, because in other places it has been withdrawn from many individual hands. In any given branch of industry, centralization would reach its extreme limit if all the individual capitals invested there were fused into a single capital. In a given society, this limit would be reached only when the entire social capital was united in the hands of either a single capitalist or a single capitalist company. Centralization supplements the work of accumulation by enabling industrial capitalists to extend the scale of their operations. Whether this latter result is the consequence of accumulation or centralization, whether centralization is accompanied by the violent means of annexation, where certain capitals become such preponderant centers of attraction for others that they shatter the individual cohesion of the latter and then draw the separate fragments to themselves, or whether the fusion of a number of capitals already formed, or in process of formation, takes place by the smoother process of organizing joint stock companies, the economic effect remains the same. Everywhere, the increased scale of industrial establishments is the starting point for a more comprehensive organization of the collective labor of many people, for a broader development of their material motive forces, i.e. for the progressive transformation of isolated processes of production, carried on by customary methods, into socially combined and scientifically arranged processes of production. But accumulation, the gradual increase of capital by reproduction, as it passes from the circular to the spiral form, is clearly a very slow procedure compared with centralization, which needs only to change the quantitative groupings of the constituent parts of social capital. The world would still be without railways if it had had to wait until accumulation had got a few individual capitals far enough to be adequate for the construction of a railway. Centralization, however, accomplished this in the twinkling of an eye, by means of joint stock companies. And while in this way centralization intensifies and accelerates the effects of accumulation, it simultaneously extends and speeds up those revolutions in the technical composition of capital, which raise its constant portion at the expense of its variable portion, thus diminishing the relative demand for labor. The masses of capital welded together overnight by centralization reproduce and multiply, as the others do, only more rapidly, and they thereby become new and powerful levers of social accumulation, Therefore, when we speak of the progress of social accumulation, we tacitly include, these days, the effects of centralization. The additional capitals formed in the normal course of accumulation, see chapter 24, section 1, serve above all as vehicles for the exploitation of new inventions and discoveries, and industrial improvements in general. But in time, the old capital itself reaches the point where it has to be renewed in all its aspects, a time when it sheds its skin and is reborn like the other capitals in a perfected technical shape, in which a smaller quantity of labor will suffice to set in motion a larger quantity of machinery and raw material. The absolute reduction in the demand for labor, which necessarily follows from this, is obviously so much the greater, the higher the degree to which the capitals undergoing this process of renewal are already massed together by virtue of the movement towards centralization. On the one hand, therefore, the additional capital formed in the course of further accumulation attracts fewer and fewer workers in proportion to its magnitude. On the other hand, the old capital, periodically reproduced with a new composition, repels more and more of the workers formerly employed by it. Section 3. The Progressive Production of a Relative Surplus Population, or Industrial Reserve Army.
The accumulation of capital, which originally appeared only as its quantitative extension, comes to fruition, as we have seen, through a progressive qualitative change in its composition, i.e. through a continuing increase of its constant component at the expense of its variable component. The specifically capitalist mode of production, the development of the productivity of labor which corresponds to it, and the change in the organic composition of capital which results from it, are things which do not merely keep pace with the progress of accumulation or the growth of social wealth. They develop at a much quicker rate, because simple accumulation, or the absolute expansion of the total social capital, is accompanied by the centralization of its individual elements, and because the change in the technical composition of the additional capital goes hand in hand with a similar change in the technical composition of the original capital. With the progress of accumulation, therefore, the proportion of constant to variable capital changes. If it was originally, say, 1 to 1, it now becomes successively 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, etc., so that as capital grows, instead of one half its total value, only one third, one quarter, etc., is turned into labor power, and so on the other hand, two thirds, three quarters, etc., into means of production. Since the demand for labor is determined not by the extent of the total capital, but by its variable constituent alone, that demand falls progressively with the growth of the total capital, instead of rising in proportion to it, as was previously assumed. It falls relatively to the magnitude of the total capital, and at an accelerated rate as this magnitude increases. With the growth of the total capital, its variable constituent, the labor incorporated in it, does admittedly increase, but in a constantly diminishing proportion. The intermediate pauses in which accumulation works as simple extension of production on a given technical basis are shortened. It is not merely that an accelerated accumulation of the total capital, accelerated in a constantly growing progression, is needed to absorb an additional number of workers, or even on account of the constant metamorphosis of old capital to keep employed those already performing their functions. This increasing accumulation and centralization also becomes, in its turn, a source of new changes in the composition of capital or in other words, of an accelerated diminution of the capital's variable component, as compared with its constant one. This accelerated relative diminution of the variable component, which accompanies the accelerated increase of the total capital and moves more rapidly than this increase, takes the inverse form, at the other pole, of an apparently absolute increase in the working population, an increase which always moves more rapidly than that of the variable capital or the means of employment. But in fact, it is capitalist accumulation itself that constantly produces, and produces indeed in direct relation with its own energy and extent, a relatively redundant working population, i.e. a population which is superfluous to capital's average requirements for its own valorization, and is therefore a surplus population. If we consider the total social capital, we can say that the movement of its accumulation sometimes causes periodic changes and at other times distributes various phases simultaneously over the different spheres of production. In some spheres, a change in the composition of capital occurs without any increase in its absolute magnitude, as a consequence of simple concentration. In others, the absolute growth of capital is connected with an absolute diminution in its variable component, or in other words, in the labor power absorbed by it. In others, again, capital continues to grow for a time on its existing technical basis, and attracts additional labor power in proportion to its increase, while at other times it undergoes organic change and reduces its variable component. In all spheres, the increase of the variable part of the capital, and therefore the number of workers employed by it, is always connected with violent fluctuations and the temporary production of a surplus population, whether this takes the more striking form of the extrusion of workers already employed or the less evident but not less real form of a greater difficulty in absorbing the additional working population through its customary outlets. Owing to the magnitude of the already functioning social capital and the degree of its increase, owing to the extension of the scale of production and the great mass of workers set in motion, owing to the development of the productivity of their labor and the greater breadth and richness of the steam springing from all the sources of wealth, there is also an extension of the scale on which greater attraction of workers by capital is accompanied by their greater repulsion. An increase takes place in the rapidity of the change in the organic composition of capital and in its technical form, and an increasing number of spheres of production become involved in this change, sometimes simultaneously and sometimes alternatively. The working population therefore produces both the accumulation of capital and the means by which it is itself made relatively superfluous, and it does this to an extent which is always increasing. This is a law of population peculiar to the capitalist mode of production, and in fact every particular historical mode of production has its own special laws of population, which are historically valid within that particular sphere.
An abstract law of population exists only for plants and animals, and even then only in the absence of any historical intervention by man. But if a surplus population of workers is a necessary product of accumulation or of the development of wealth on a capitalist basis, this surplus population also becomes, conversely, the lever of capitalist accumulation. Indeed, it becomes a condition for the existence of the capitalist mode of production. It forms a disposable industrial reserve army, which belongs to capital just as absolutely as if the latter had bred it at its own cost. Independently of the limits of the actual increase of population, it creates a mass of human material always ready for exploitation by capital in the interests of capital's own changing valorization requirements. With accumulation and the development of the productivity of labor that accompanies it, capital's power of sudden expansion also grows. It grows not merely because the elasticity of the capital already functioning increases, not merely because the absolute wealth of society expands, and capital only forms an elastic part of this, not merely because credit, under every special stimulus, at once places an unusual part of this wealth at the disposal of production in the form of additional capital. It also grows because the technical conditions of the production process, machinery, means of transport, etc., themselves now make possible a very rapid transformation of masses of surplus product into additional means of production. The mass of social wealth, overflowing with the advance of accumulation and capable of being transformed into additional capital, thrusts itself frantically into the old branches of production, whose market suddenly expands, or into newly formed branches such as railways, etc., which now become necessary as a result of the further development of the old branches. In all such cases, there must be the possibility of suddenly throwing great masses of men into the decisive areas without doing any damage to the scale of production in other spheres. The surplus population supplies these masses. The path characteristically described by modern industry, which takes the form of a decennial cycle, interrupted by smaller oscillations, of periods of average activity, production at high pressure, crisis, and stagnation, depends on the constant formation, the greater or less absorption, and the reformation of the industrial reserve army or surplus population. In their turn, the varying phases of the industrial cycle recruit the surplus population and become one of the most energetic agencies for its reproduction. This peculiar cyclical path of modern industry, which occurs in no earlier period of human history, was also impossible when capitalist production was in its infancy. The composition of capital, at that time, underwent only very gradual changes. By and large, therefore, the proportional growth in the demand for labor has corresponded to the accumulation of capital. Even though the advance of accumulation was slow in comparison with that of the modern epoch, it came up against a natural barrier in the shape of the exploitable working population. This barrier could only be swept away by the violent means we shall discuss later. The expansion by fits and starts of the scale of production is the precondition for its equally sudden contractions. The latter again evokes the former, but the former is impossible without disposable human material, without an increase in the number of workers which must occur independently of the absolute growth of the population. This increase is affected by the simple process that constantly sets free a part of the working class, by methods which lessen the number of workers employed in proportion to the increased production. Modern industry's whole form of motion therefore depends on the constant transformation of a part of the working population into unemployed or semi-employed hands. The superficiality of political economy shows itself in the fact that it views the expansion and contraction of credit as the cause of the periodic alternations in the industrial cycle, whereas it is a mere symptom of them. Just as the heavenly bodies always repeat a certain movement once they have been flung into it, so also does social production once it has been flung into this movement of alternate expansion and contraction. Effects become causes in their turn and the various vicissitudes of the whole process, which always reproduces its own conditions, takes on the form of a periodicity. When this periodicity has once become consolidated, even political economy sees that the production of a relative surplus population, i.e. a population surplus in relation to capital's average requirements for valorization, is a necessary condition for modern industry. Suppose, says H. Merivale, formerly professor of political economy at Oxford, and later on employed at the colonial office, suppose that, on the occasion of some of these crises, the nation were to rouse itself to the effort of getting rid by emigration of some hundreds of thousands of superfluous arms. What would be the consequence? That at the first returning demand for labor, there would be a deficiency. However rapid reproduction may be, it takes, at all events, the space of a generation to replace the loss of adult labor. Now the profits of our manufacturers depend mainly on the power of making use of the prosperous moment when demand is brisk, and thus compensating themselves for the interval during which it is slack. 
This power is secured to them only by the command of machinery and of manual labor. They must have hands ready by them, and they must be able to increase the activity of their operations when required and to slacken it again according to the state of the market, for they cannot possibly maintain that preeminence in the race of competition on which the wealth of the country is founded. Even Malthus recognizes that a surplus population is a necessity of modern industry, although he explains this in his narrow fashion not by saying that part of the working population has been rendered relatively superfluous, but by referring to its excessive growth. He says, quote, Prudential habits with regard to marriage, carried on a considerable extent among the laboring class of a country, mainly depending upon manufactures and commerce, might injure it. From the nature of a population, an increase of laborers cannot be brought into market in consequence of a particular demand till after the lapse of 16 or 18 years, and the conversion of revenue into capital by saving may take place much more rapidly. A country is always liable to an increase in the quantity of the funds for the maintenance of the labor faster than the increase of population. After political economy has thus declared that the constant production of a relative surplus population of workers is a necessity of capitalist accumulation, she very aptly adopts the shape of an old maid and puts into the mouth of her ideal capitalist the following words addressed to the redundant workers who have been thrown onto the streets by their own creation of additional capital. Quote, we manufacturers do what we can for you whilst we are increasing that capital on which you must subsist and you must do the rest by accommodating your numbers to the means of subsistence. End quote from Harriet Martineau. Capitalist production can by no means content itself with the quantity of disposable labor power which the natural increase of population yields. It requires for its unrestricted activity an industrial reserve army which is independent of these natural limits. We have so far assumed that the increase or diminution of the variable capital corresponds precisely with the increase or diminution of the number of workers employed. But the same number of workers under the command of capital may remain the same, or even fall, while the variable capital increases. This is the case if the individual worker provides more labor, and his wages thus increase, although the price of labor remains the same or even falls, only more slowly than the mass of labor rises. Increase of variable capital in this case becomes an index of more labor, but not of more workers employed. It is the absolute interest of every capitalist to extort a given quantity of labor out of a smaller rather than a greater number of workers, if the cost is about the same. In the latter case, the outlay of constant capital increases in proportion to the mass of labor set in motion. In the former, that increase is much smaller. The more extended the scale of production, the more decisive is this motive. Its force increases with the accumulation of capital. We have seen that the development of the capitalist mode of production and of the productivity of labor, which is at once the cause and the effect of accumulation, enables the capitalist, with the same outlay of variable capital, to set in motion more labor by greater exploitation, either extensive or intensive, of each individual labor power. We have further seen that the capitalist buys with the same capital a greater mass of labor power, as he progressively replaces skilled workers by less skilled, mature labor power by immature, male by female, that of adults by that of young persons or children. On the one hand, therefore, with the progress of accumulation, a larger variable capital sets more labor in motion without enlisting more workers. On the other, a variable capital of the same magnitude sets in motion more labor with the same mass of labor power. And finally, a greater number of inferior labor powers is set in motion by the displacement of more skilled labor powers. The production of a relative surplus population, or the setting free of workers, therefore proceeds still more rapidly than the technical transformation of the process of production that accompanies the advance of accumulation and is accelerated by it, and more rapidly than the corresponding diminution of the variable part of the capital as compared with the constant. If the means of production, as they increase in extent and effective power, become to a lesser extent means for employing workers, this relation is itself in turn modified by the fact that in proportion as the productivity of labor increases, capital increases its supply of labor more quickly than its demand for workers. The overwork of the employed part of the working class swells the ranks of its reserve, while conversely, the greater pressure that the reserve by its competition exerts on the employed workers forces them to submit to overwork and subjects them to the dictates of capital. The condemnation of one part of the working class to enforced idleness by the overwork of the other part, and vice versa, becomes a means of enriching the individual capitalists, and accelerates at the same time the production of an industrial reserve army on a scale corresponding with the progress of social accumulation, the importance of this element in the formation of the relative surplus population is shown by the example of England. Her technical means for the saving of labor are colossal. 
Nevertheless, if tomorrow morning labor were universally to be reduced to a rational amount and proportioned to the different sections of the working class according to age and sex, the available working population would be absolutely insufficient to carry on the nation's production on its present scale. The great majority of the now unproductive workers would have to be turned into productive ones. Taking them as a whole, the general movements of wages are exclusively regulated by the expansion and contraction of the Industrial Reserve Army, and this in turn corresponds to the periodic alternations of the industrial cycle. They are not, therefore, determined by the variations of the absolute numbers of the working population, but by the varying proportions in which the working class is divided into an active army and a reserve army, by the increase or diminution in the relative amount of the surplus population, by the extent to which it is alternately absorbed and set free. The appropriate law for modern industry, with its decennial cycles and periodic phases which, as accumulation advances, are complicated by irregular oscillations following each other more and more quickly, is the law of the regulation of the demand and supply of labor by the alternate expansion and contraction of capital, i.e. by the level of capital's valorization requirements at the relevant moment, the labor market sometimes appearing relatively undersupplied because capital is expanding, and sometimes relatively oversupplied because it is contracting. It would be utterly absurd in place of this to lay down a law according to which the movements of the capital depended simply on the movements of the population. Yet this is the dogma of the economists. According to them, wages rise as a result of the accumulation of capital. Higher wages stimulate the working population to more rapid multiplication, and this goes on until the labor market becomes oversupplied, and hence capital becomes insufficient in relation to the supply of labor. Wages fall, and now we have the obverse side of the metal. The working population is, little by little, decimated by the fall in wages, so that capital is again in excess in relation to the workers, or as others explain it, the fall in wages and the corresponding increase in the exploitation of the workers again accelerates accumulation, while at the same time, the lower wages hold the growth of the working class in check. Then the time comes round again when the supply of labor is less than the demand, wages rise, and so on. This would indeed be a beautiful form of motion for developed capitalist production. Before the rise in wages could produce any positive increase of the population really fit for work, the deadline would long since have passed, within which the industrial campaign would have to have been carried through, and the battle fought to a conclusive finish. Between 1849 and 1859, a rise of wages which was in practice merely nominal, although it was accompanied by a fall in the price of corn, took place in the English agricultural districts. In Wiltshire, for example, the weekly wage rose from seven shillings to eight shillings. In Dorsetshire, it rose from seven shillings to eight or nine, and so on. This was the result of an unusual exodus of the agricultural surplus population caused by wartime demands, and by the vast extension of railways, factories, mines, etc. The lower the wage, the higher is the proportion in which even a very insignificant increase is expressed. If the weekly wage, for instance, is 20 shillings, and it rises to 22 shillings, that is a rise of 10%. But if it is only 7 shillings and it rises to 9, that is a rise of 28 and 4 sevenths percent, which sounds very fine. Anyway, the farmers howled, and the London economist, with reference to these starvation wages, prattled quite seriously of a general and substantial advance. What did the farmers do now? Did they wait until the agricultural laborers had so increased and multiplied as a result of this splendid remuneration that their wages had to fall again, which is the way things are supposed to happen according to the dogmatic economic brain? No, they introduced more machinery, and in a moment the laborers were redundant again to a degree satisfactory even to the farmers. There was now more capital laid out in agriculture than before, and in a more productive form. With this, the demand for labor fell, not only relatively, but absolutely. The economic fiction we have been dealing with confuses the laws that regulate the general movement of wages, or the ratio between the working class, i.e. the total sum of labor power, and the total social capital, with the laws that distribute the working population over the different spheres of production. If, for example, owing to a favorable conjuncture, accumulation in a particular sphere of production becomes especially active, and profits in it, being greater than the average profits, attract additional capital, then of course the demand for labor rises, and wages rise as well. The higher wages draw a larger part of the working population into the more favored sphere, until it is glutted with labor power, and wages at length fall again to their average level or below it, if the pressure is too great. At that point, the influx of workers into the branch of industry in question not only ceases, but gives place to an outflow of workers. Here, the political economist thinks he can grasp the situation. He thinks he can see an absolute diminution of workers accompanying an increase of wages, and a diminution of wages accompanying an absolute increase of workers. 
but he really sees only the local oscillations of the labor market in a particular sphere of production. He sees only the phenomena which accompany the distribution of the working population into the different spheres of outlay of capital, according to its varying needs. The Industrial Reserve Army, during the periods of stagnation and average prosperity, weighs down the active army of workers. During the periods of overproduction and feverish activity, it puts a curb on their pretensions. The relative surplus population is therefore the background against which the law of the demand and supply of labor does its work. It confines the field of action of this law to the limits absolutely convenient to capital's drive to exploit and dominate the workers. This is the place to return to one of the great exploits of economic apologetics. It'll be remembered that if, through the introduction of new machinery, or the extension of old, a portion of variable capital is transformed into constant capital, the economic apologist interprets this operation, which fixes capital and by that very act sets free workers, in exactly the opposite way, pretending that capital is thereby set free for the workers. Only now can one evaluate the true extent of the effrontery of these apologists. Not only are the workers directly turned out by the machines set free, but so are their future replacements in the rising generation, as well as the additional contingent which, with the usual extension of business on its old basis, would regularly be absorbed. They are now all set free, and every bit of capital looking round for a function can take advantage of them. Whether it attracts them or others, the effect on the general demand for labor will be nil, if this capital is just sufficient to take out of the market as many workers as the machines threw into it. If it employs a smaller number, the number of redundant workers increases. If it employs a greater, the general demand for labor increases only to the extent of the excess of the employed over those set free. The impulse that additional capital seeking an outlet would otherwise have given to the general demand for labor is therefore in every case neutralized until the supply of workers thrown out of employment by the machine has been exhausted. That is to say, the mechanism of capitalist production takes care that the absolute increase of capital is not accompanied by a corresponding rise in the general demand for labor. And the apologist calls this a compensation for the misery, the sufferings, the possible death of the displaced workers during the transitional period when they are banished into the industrial reserve army. The demand for labor is not identical with the increase of capital, nor is the supply of labor identical with the increase of the working class. It is not a case of two independent forces working on each other. The dice are loaded. Capital acts on both sides at once. If its accumulation on the one hand increases the demand for labor, it increases on the other the supply of workers by setting them free, while at the same time the pressure of the unemployed compels those who are employed to furnish more labor, and therefore makes the supply of labor to a certain extent independent of the supply of workers. The movement of the law of supply and demand of labor, on this basis, completes the despotism of capital. Thus, as soon as the workers learn the secret of why it happens that the more they work, the more alien wealth they produce, and that the more the productivity of their labor increases, the more does their very function as a means for the valorization of capital become precarious, as soon as they discover that the degree of intensity of the competition amongst themselves depends wholly on the pressure of the relative surplus population, as soon as by setting up trade unions, etc., they try to organize planned cooperation between the employed and the unemployed in order to obviate or to weaken the ruinous effects of this natural law of capitalist production on their class, so soon does capital and its sycophant, political economy, cry out at the infringement of the eternal and, so to speak, sacred law of supply and demand. Every combination between employed and unemployed disturbs the pure action of this law. But on the other hand, as soon as, in the colonies for example, adverse circumstances prevent the creation of an industrial reserve army, and with it the absolute dependence of the working class upon the capitalist class, capital, along with its platitudinous Sancho Panza, rebels against the sacred law of supply and demand, and tries to make up for its inadequacies by forcible means. Section 4. Different Forms of Existence of the Relative Surplus Population the general law of capitalist accumulation. The relative surplus population exists in all kinds of forms. Every worker belongs to it during the time when he is only partially employed or wholly unemployed. Leaving aside the large-scale and periodically recurring forms the changing faces of the industrial cycle impress on it, so that it sometimes appears acute in times of crisis and sometimes chronic in times when business is slack, we can identify three forms which it always possesses, the floating, the latent, and the stagnant.
In the centers of modern industry, factories, workshops, ironworks, mines, etc., the workers are sometimes repelled, sometimes attracted again, in greater masses, so that the number of those employed increases on the whole, although in a constantly decreasing proportion to the scale of production. Here, the surplus population exists in the floating form. Both in the factories proper and in the large workshops where machinery enters as one factor, or even where no more than a division of labor of a modern type has been put into operation, large numbers of male workers are employed up to the age of maturity but not beyond. Once they reach maturity, only a very small number continue to find employment in the same branches of industry, while the majority are regularly dismissed. This majority forms an element of the floating surplus population, which grows with the extension of those branches of industry. Some of these workers emigrate. In fact, they are merely following capital, which has itself emigrated. A further consequence is that the female population grows more rapidly than the male. Witness England. That the natural increase of the number of workers does not satisfy the requirements of the accumulation of capital, and yet at the same time exceeds those requirements, is a contradiction inherent in capital's very movement. Capital demands more youthful workers, fewer adults. This contradiction is no more glaring than the other contradiction, namely that a shortage of hands is complained of while at the same time many thousands are out of work because the division of labor chains them to a particular branch of industry. Moreover, the consumption of labor power by capital is so rapid that the worker has already more or less completely lived himself out when he is only halfway through his life. He falls into the ranks of the surplus population or is thrust down from a higher to a lower step in the scale. It is precisely among the workers in large-scale industry that we meet with the shortest life expectancy. Dr. Lee, medical officer of health for Manchester, stated that the average age at death of the Manchester upper middle class was 38 years, while the average age at death of the laboring class was 17, while at Liverpool those figures were represented as 35 against 15. It thus appeared that the well-to-do classes had a lease of life which was more than double the value of that which fell to the lot of the less favored citizens. Under these circumstances, the absolute increase of this section of the proletariat must take a form which swells their numbers, despite the rapid wastage of their individual elements. Hence, rapid replacement of one generation of workers by another. This law does not hold for the other classes of the population. This social requirement is met by early marriages, which are a necessary consequence of the conditions in which workers in large-scale industry live, and by the premium that the exploitation of the workers' children sets on their production. As soon as capitalist production takes possession of agriculture, and in proportion to the extent to which it does so, the demand for a rural working population falls absolutely, while the accumulation of the capital employed in agriculture advances, without this repulsion being compensated for by a greater attraction of workers, as is the case in the non-agricultural industries. Part of the agricultural population is therefore constantly on the point of passing over into an urban or manufacturing proletariat, and on the lookout for opportunities to complete this transformation. The term manufacture is used here to cover all non-agricultural industries. There is thus a constant flow from this source of the relative surplus population. But the constant movement towards the towns presupposes, in the countryside itself, a constant latent surplus population, the extent of which only becomes evident at those exceptional times when its distribution channels are wide open. The wages of the agricultural laborer are therefore reduced to a minimum, and he always stands with one foot already in the swamp of pauperism. The third category of the relative surplus population is the stagnant population. This forms a part of the active labor army, but with extremely irregular employment. Hence, it offers capital an inexhaustible reservoir of disposable labor power. Its conditions of life sink below the average normal level of the working class, and it is precisely this which makes it a broad foundation for special branches of capitalist exploitation. It is characterized by a maximum of working time and a minimum of wages. We have already become familiar with its chief form under the rubric of domestic industry. It is constantly recruited from workers in large-scale industry and agriculture who have become redundant, and especially from those decaying branches of industry where handicraft is giving way to manufacture and manufacture to machinery. Its extent grows in proportion as, with the growth in the extent and energy of accumulation, the creation of a surplus population also advances, but it forms at the same time a self-reproducing and self-perpetuating element of the working class, taking a proportionately greater part in the general increase of that class than the other elements. In fact, not only the number of births and deaths, but the absolute size of families stands in inverse proportion to the level of wages, and therefore to the amount of the means of subsistence at the disposal of different categories of worker. This law of capitalist society would sound absurd to savages, or even to civilized colonists. 
It calls to mind the boundless reproduction of animals individually weak and constantly hunted down. Finally, the lowest sediment of the relative surplus population dwells in the sphere of pauperism, Apart from vagabonds, criminals, prostitutes, in short, the actual lumpen proletariat, this social stratum consists of three categories. First, those able to work. One need only glance superficially at the statistics of English pauperism to find that the quantity of paupers increases with every crisis of trade and diminishes with every revival. Second, orphans and pauper children. These are candidates for the Industrial Reserve Army and in times of great prosperity, such as the year 1860, for instance, they are enrolled in the army of active workers, both speedily and in large numbers. Third, the demoralized, the ragged, and those unable to work, chiefly people who succumb to their incapacity for adaptation, an incapacity which results from the division of labor, people who have lived beyond the worker's average lifespan, and the victims of industry, whose number increases with the growth of dangerous machinery, of mines, chemical works, etc., the mutilated, the sickly, the widows, etc. Pauperism is the hospital of the active labor army and the dead weight of the industrial reserve army. Its production is included in that of the relative surplus population. Its necessity is implied by their necessity. Along with the surplus population, pauperism forms a condition of capitalist production and of the capitalist development of wealth. It forms part of the faux flay of capitalist production, but capital usually knows how to transfer these from its own shoulders to those of the working class and the petty bourgeoisie. The greater the social wealth, the functioning capital, the extent and energy of its growth, and therefore also the greater of the absolute mass of the proletariat and the productivity of its labor, the greater is the industrial reserve army. The same causes which develop the expansive power of capital also develop the labor power at its disposal. The relative mass of the industrial reserve army thus increases with the potential energy of wealth. But the greater this reserve army in proportion to the active labor army, the greater is the mass of a consolidated surplus population, whose misery is in inverse ratio to the amount of torture it has to undergo in the form of labor. The more extensive, finally, the pauperized section of the working class and the industrial reserve army, the greater is official pauperism. This is the absolute general law of capitalist accumulation. Like all other laws, it is modified in its working by many circumstances, the analysis of which does not concern us here. We can now understand the foolishness of the economic wisdom which preaches to the workers that they should adapt their numbers to the valorization requirements of capital. The mechanism of capitalist production and accumulation itself constantly effects this adjustment. The first word of this adaptation is the creation of a relative surplus population, or industrial reserve army. Its last word is the misery of constantly expanding strata of the active army of labor and the dead weight of pauperism. On the basis of capitalism, a system in which the worker does not employ the means of production, but the means of production employ the worker, the law by which a constantly increasing quantity of means of production may be set in motion by a progressively diminishing expenditure of human power, thanks to the advance in the productivity of social labor, undergoes a complete inversion and is expressed thus. The higher the productivity of labor, the greater is the pressure of the workers on the means of employment, the more precarious, therefore, becomes the condition for their existence, namely the sale of their own labor power for the increase of alien wealth, or in other words, the self-valorization of capital. The fact that the means of production and the productivity of labor increase more rapidly than the productive population expresses itself, therefore, under capitalism in the inverse form that the working population always increases more rapidly than the valorization requirements of capital. We saw in Part 4, when analyzing the production of relative surplus value, that within the capitalist system all methods for raising the social productivity of labor are put into effect at the cost of the individual worker that all means for the development of production undergo a dialectical inversion so that they become means of domination and exploitation of the producers. They distort the worker into a fragment of a man. They degrade him to the level of an appendage of a machine. They destroy the actual content of his labor by turning it into a torment. They alienate from him the intellectual potentialities of the labor process in the same proportion as science is incorporated in it as an independent power. They deform the conditions under which he works, subject him during the labor process to a despotism the more hateful for its meanness. They transform his lifetime into working time and drag his wife and child beneath the wheels of the juggernaut of capital. But all methods for the production of surplus value are at the same time methods of accumulation, and every extension of accumulation becomes, conversely, a means for the development of those methods.
It follows, therefore, that in proportion as capital accumulates, the situation of the worker, because payment high or low, must grow worse. Finally, the law which always holds the relative surplus population or industrial reserve army in equilibrium with the extent and energy of accumulation rivets the worker to capital more firmly than the wedges of Hephaestes held Prometheus to the rock. It makes an accumulation of misery a necessary condition, corresponding to the accumulation of wealth. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is, therefore, at the same time accumulation of misery, the torment of labor, slavery, ignorance, brutalization, and moral degradation at the opposite pole, i.e. on the side of the class that produces its own product as capital. This antagonistic character of capitalist accumulation is enunciated in various forms by political economists, although they lump it together with other phenomena, which are admittedly to some extent analogous, but nevertheless essentially distinct, since they appear only in pre-capitalist modes of production. The Venetian monk Ortez, one of the greatest economic writers of the 18th century, regards the antagonism of capitalist production as a universal natural law of social wealth. Quote, In the economy of a nation, advantages and evils always balance each other. The abundance of wealth with some people is always equal to the lack of wealth with others. The great riches of a small number are always accompanied by the absolute deprivation of the essential necessities of life for many others. The wealth of a nation corresponds with its population, and its misery corresponds with its wealth. Diligence, in some, compels idleness in others. The poor and idle are a necessary consequence of the rich and active. And so on. About ten years after Ortez, the high church Protestant parson Townsend glorified misery as a necessary condition of wealth in a thoroughly brutal way. Quote, legal constraint to labor is attended with too much trouble, violence, and noise, whereas hunger is not only a peaceable, silent, unremitted pressure, but as the most natural motive to industry and labor, it calls forth the most powerful exertions. Everything, therefore, depends on making hunger permanent among the working class, and this is provided for, according to Townsend, by the principle of population, which is especially applicable to the poor. It seems to be a law of nature that the poor should be, to a certain degree, improvident, i.e. so improvident as to be born without silver spoons in their mouths, that there may always be some to fulfill the most servile, the most sordid, and the most ignoble offices in the community. The stock of human happiness is thereby much increased, whilst the more delicate are not only relieved from drudgery, but are left at liberty, without interruption, to pursue those callings which are suited to their various dispositions. The poor law tends to destroy the harmony and beauty, the symmetry and order of that system which God and nature have established in the world. If the Venetian monk, found in fatal destiny that makes misery eternal a justification for the existence of Christian charity, celibacy, monasteries, and pious foundations, the beneficed Protestant finds in it a pretext for condemning the laws by which the poor possessed a right to a miserable amount of public relief. The progress of social wealth, says Stork, begets this useful class of society, which performs the most wearisome, the vilest, the most disgusting functions, which, in a word, takes on its shoulders all that is disagreeable and servile in life, and procures thus for other classes leisure, serenity of mind, and conventional dignity of character. Stork then asks himself what the actual advantage is of this capitalist civilization, with its misery and its degradation of the masses, as compared with barbarism. He can find only one answer. Security. Thanks to the advance of industry and science, says Sismondi, every worker can produce every day much more than he needs to consume. But at the same time, while his labor produces wealth, that wealth would, were he called on to consume it himself, make him less fit for labor. According to him, men, i.e. non-workers, would probably prefer to do without all artistic perfection and all the enjoyments that industry procures for us if it were necessary that all should buy them by constant toil like that of the worker. Exertion today is separated from its recompense. It is not the same man that first works and then reposes, but it is because the one works that the other rests. The indefinite multiplication of the productive powers of labor can have no other result than the increase of luxury and enjoyment on the part of the idle rich. And finally, that fish-blooded bourgeois doctrinaire de Stout de Tracy makes the point in the most brutal fashion. In poor nations, the people are comfortable. In rich nations, they are generally poor. Section 5. Illustrations of the General Law of Capitalist Accumulation Subsection A. 
England from 1846 to 1866. No period of modern society is so favorable for the study of capitalist accumulation as the period of the last 20 years. It's as if Fortunatus's purse has been discovered. But of all countries, England again provides the classical example because it holds the foremost place in the world market, because capitalist production is fully developed only in England, and finally, because the introduction of the free trade millennium since 1846 has cut off the last retreat of vulgar economics. We have already sufficiently indicated the titanic progress of production in Part 4. In fact, in the latter half of the 20-year period under discussion, it has gone far beyond its progress in the former half. Although the absolute growth of the English population in the last half century has been very great, the relative increase, or rate of growth, has fallen constantly, as is shown by the following table, borrowed from the census, which gives the average annual increase of the population of England and Wales over successive 10-year periods. Let us now, on the other hand, consider the increase of wealth. Here, the movements of profits, ground rents, etc., which are subject to income tax, provides the surest basis. The increase of profits liable to income tax in Great Britain from 1853 to 1864, farmers in some other categories not included, amounted to 50.47%, or an annual average of 4.58%, while the population itself increased during the same period by about 12%. The augmentation of the rent of the land subject to taxation, including houses, railways, mines, fisheries, etc., amounted for 1853 to 1864 to 38%, or 3 and 5 twelfths percent annually. Under this heading, the following categories showed the greatest increase. Houses, quarries, mines, ironworks, fisheries, gasworks, and railways. If we compare the years from 1853 to 1864, in three sets of four consecutive years each, the rate of increase of these incomes accelerates constantly. Incomes arising from profits increased between 1853 and 1857 at 1.73% a year. In 1857 to 61, 2.74%. In 1861 to 4, 9.3% a year. The sum of the incomes of the UK that came under the income tax was, in 1856, 3.07 million pounds. In 1859, 3.28 million pounds. In 1862, 3.52 million pounds. In 1863, 3.59 million pounds. In 1864, 3.62 million pounds. In 1865, 3.85 million pounds. The accumulation of capital was accompanied at the same time by its concentration and centralization. Although no official statistics of agriculture existed for England, they did for Ireland, they were voluntarily given in 10 counties. It emerged from these statistics that between 1851 and 1861, the number of farms of less than 100 acres had fallen from 31,583 to 26,597, so that 5,016 had been thrown together into larger farms. From 1815 to 1825, no personal estate of more than £1 million came under the succession duty. From 1825 to 1855, however, eight did. And from 1856 to June of 1859, i.e. in four and a half years, four did. The centralization will best be seen, however, from a short analysis of the income tax schedule D, profits exclusive of farms, etc., in the years 1864 and 1865. I note in advance that incomes from this source pay income tax on everything over £60. Pounds. These taxable incomes amounted in England, Wales, and Scotland in 1864 to £95.84 million, pounds. in 1865 to £105.44 million. Pounds. The number of persons taxed was, in 1864, 308,416 out of a population of 23,891,009, in 1865, 332,431 out of a population of 24,127,003. The following table shows the distribution of these incomes in the two years. The aforementioned graphic cannot be read aloud for the recording. Please consult page 804 of a physical or digital copy of the book for visual reference. In 1855, there were produced in the United Kingdom 61.5 million tons of coal, of value 16.1 million pounds. In 1864, 92.8 million tons, of value 23.2 million pounds. In 1855, 3.2 million tons of pig iron, of value of 8.0 million pounds. In 1864, 4.8 million tons of value of 11.9 million pounds. In 1854, the length of railways in use in the United Kingdom was 8,054 miles, with a paid-up capital of 286.0 million pounds. In 
In 1864, the length was 12,789 miles, with a paid-up capital of 425.7 million pounds. In 1854, the total sum of the exports and imports of the United Kingdom was 268.2 million pounds. In 1865, 489.9 million pounds. The following table shows the movement of exports. After these few examples, one understands the cry of triumph uttered by the Registrar General, quote, Rapidly, as the population has increased, it has not kept pace with the progress of industry and wealth. Let us now return to the direct agents of this industry, or the producers of this wealth, the working class. Quote, it is one of the most melancholy features in the social state of this country, says Gladstone, that we see, beyond the possibility of denial, that while there is at this moment a decrease in the consuming powers of the people, an increase of the pressure and privations and distress upon the working class, there is at the same time a constant accumulation of wealth in the upper classes, an increase of the luxuriousness of their habits and of their means of enjoyment. Thus spake this unctuous minister in the House of Commons on the 13th of February, 1843. On the 16th of April, 1863, 20 years later, in the speech in which he introduced his budget, he said, quote, From 1842 to 52, the taxable income of the country increased by 6%. In the eight years from 1853 to 61, it had increased from the basis taken in 1853 by 20%. The fact is so astonishing as to be almost incredible. This intoxicating augmentation of wealth and power, entirely confined to classes of property, must be of indirect benefit to the laboring population, because it cheapens commodities of general consumption. While the rich have been growing richer, the poor have been growing less poor. At any rate, whether the extremes of poverty are less, I do not presume to say. How lame an anticlimax! If the working class had remained poor, only less poor, in proportion as it produces for the wealthy class an intoxicating augmentation of wealth and power, then it has remained relatively just as poor. If the extremes of poverty have not lessened, they have increased, because the extremes of wealth have. As for the cheapening of the means of subsistence, the official statistics, for instance the accounts of the London Orphan Asylum, show an increase in price of 20% over the last 10 years. If we compare the average of the three years 1860 to 1862 with the average of 1851 to 53. In the following three years, 63 to 65, there was a progressive rise in the price of meat, butter, milk, sugar, salt, coal, and a number of other necessary means of subsistence. Gladstone's next budget speech of the 7th of April 1864 is a Pindaric dithyram on the progress of surplus value extraction and the happiness of the people, moderated by poverty. He speaks of the masses, quote, on the border of pauperism, of branches of trade in which wages have not increased, and finally sums up the happiness of the working class in the words, human life is but, in nine cases out of ten, a struggle for existence. Professor Fawcett, not bound like Gladstone by official considerations, declares roundly, quote, I do not, of course, deny that money wages have been augmented by this increase of capital in the last ten years, but this apparent advantage is to a great extent lost because many of the necessaries of life are becoming dearer. He believes that this is because of the fall in value of the precious metals. The rich grow rapidly richer, whilst there is no perceptible advance in the comfort enjoyed by the industrial classes. They, the workers, become almost the slaves of the tradesmen to whom they owe money. In the chapters on the working day and machinery, the reader has seen the circumstances under which the British working class created an intoxicating augmentation of wealth and power for the possessing classes. There we were chiefly concerned with the worker while he was exercising his social function. But for a full elucidation of the law of accumulation, his condition outside the workshop must also be looked at, his condition as to food and accommodation. The limits of this book compel us to concern ourselves chiefly with the worst paid part of the industrial proletariat and the agricultural laborers, who together form the majority of the working class. But before this, just one word about official pauperism, or the part of the working class which has forfeited its condition of existence, the sale of labor power, and vegetates on public alms. The official list of paupers in England numbered 851,369 persons in 1855. 877,767 in 1856, and 971,433 in 1865. As a result of the cotton famine, it swelled to 1.08 million in 1863 and 1.01 million in 1864. 
The crisis of 1866, which hit London most severely, created there, in the center of the world market, a city with more inhabitants than the Kingdom of Scotland, an increase of pauperism for the year 1866 of 19.5% compared with 1865, and of 24.4% compared with 1864, and a still greater increase for the first three months of 1867 as compared with 66. Two points emerge clearly when we analyze these statistics of pauperism. On the one hand, the rise and fall of the number of paupers reflects the periodic changes of the industrial cycle. On the other, the official statistics become more and more misleading as to the actual extent of pauperism in proportion as, with the accumulation of capital, the class struggle develops, and hence the class consciousness of the workers as well. For example, the barbarous nature of the treatment of the paupers, at which the English press, being the Times, the Pall Mall Gazette, etc., has cried out so loudly during the last two years, is in fact of ancient date. Friedrich Engels in 1844 demonstrated exactly the same horrors and exactly the same transient canting outcries of sensational literature. But the frightful increase in the number of deaths by starvation in London during the last ten years proves beyond doubt the growing horror in which the workers hold the slavery of the workhouse, that place of punishment for poverty. Subsection B. The Badly Paid Strata of the British Industrial Working Class During the Cotton Famine of 1862-3, Dr. Edward Smith was charged by the Privy Council to make an investigation into the conditions of nourishment of the distressed cotton workers of Lancashire and Cheshire. His observations during many preceding years had led him to the conclusion that to avert starvation diseases, the daily food of an average woman ought to contain at least 3,900 grains of carbon and 180 grains of nitrogen, the daily food of an average man at least 4,300 grains of carbon and 200 grains of nitrogen. For women, about the same quantity of nutritive elements are contained in two pounds of good wheat and bread, for men, one-ninth more. For the weekly average of adult men and women, at least 28,600 grains of carbon and 1,330 grains of nitrogen. His calculation was practically confirmed in a surprising manner by its agreement with the miserable quantity of nourishment to which the emergency had reduced the consumption of the cotton workers. This was, in December of 1862, 29,211 grains of carbon and 1,295 grains of nitrogen a week. In 1863, the Privy Council ordered an investigation into the state of distress of the worst nourished part of the English working class. Dr. Simon, medical officer to the Privy Council, chose for this work the above-mentioned Dr. Smith. His inquiry covers on the one hand the agricultural laborers, on the other hand silk weavers, needle women, kid glovers, stocking weavers, glove weavers, and shoemakers. The latter categories are, with the exception of the stocking weavers, exclusively town dwellers. It was made a rule in this inquiry to select in each category the most healthy families and those comparatively in the best circumstances. As a general result, it was found that, quote, in only one of the examined classes of indoor operatives did the average nitrogen supply just exceed, while in another it nearly reached, the estimated standard of bare sufficiency, i.e. sufficient to avert starvation disease and that in two classes there was defect, in one a very large defect, of both nitrogen and carbon. Moreover, as regards the examined families of the agricultural population, it appeared that more than a fifth were with less than the estimated sufficiency of carbonaceous food, and that more than one-third were with less than the estimated sufficiency of nitrogenous food, and that in three counties, Berkshire, Oxfordshire, and Somersetshire, insufficiency of nitrogenous food was the average local diet. Among the agricultural laborers, those of England, the wealthiest part of the United Kingdom, were the worst fed. The insufficiency of food among the agricultural laborers fell, as a rule, chiefly on the women and children, for, quote, the man must eat to do his work. Still greater penury ravaged the urban workers he examined. They are so ill-fed that assuredly among them there must be many cases of severe and injurious privation. This is all abstinence on the part of the capitalist, for it is abstinence from paying for the means of subsistence absolutely necessary for the mere vegetation of his hands. The following table shows the conditions of nourishment for both sexes of the above-named categories of purely town-dwelling workers, as compared with the minimum assumed by Dr. Smith, and with the food allowance of the cotton workers during the time of their greatest distress. Just under one-half of the categories of industrial worker investigated had absolutely no beer and 28% no milk. The weekly average of liquid means of nourishment in the families varied from 7 ounces, in the case of the needlewomen, to 24 and 3 quarters ounces, in the case of the stocking makers. The majority of those who did not obtain milk were needlewomen in London, 
The quantity of bread consumed weekly varied from 7 and 3 quarters pounds for the needlewomen to 11 and 1 half pound for the shoemakers, and gave a total average of 9.9 .9 pounds per adult weekly. Sugar varied from 4 ounces weekly for the kid glovers to 11 ounces for the stocking makers, and the total average per week for all categories was 8 ounces per adult per week. The total weekly average butter intake, being fat, etc., was 5 ounces per adult. The weekly average of meat varied from 7 and 1 quarter ounces for the silk weavers to 18 and 1 quarter ounces for the kid glovers. The total average for the different categories, 13.6 ounces. The weekly cost of food per adult was expressed in the following average figures. Silk weavers, 2 shillings, 2 and a half pence. Needlewomen, 2 shillings, 7 pence. Kid glovers, 2 shillings, 9 and a half pence. Shoemakers, 2 shillings, 7 and 3 quarters pence. Stocking weavers, 2 shillings, 6 and 1 quarter pence. For the silk weavers of Macclesfield, the average was only one shilling eight and a half pence. The worst nourished categories were the needlewomen, silk weavers, and kid glovers. In his general health report, Dr. Simon says this about the state of nourishment, quote, that cases are innumerable in which the defective diet is the cause or the aggravator of disease can be affirmed by anyone who is conversant with poor law medical practice or with the wards and outpatient rooms of hospitals. Yet in this point of view there is, in my opinion, a very important sanitary context to be added. It must be remembered that privation of food is very reluctantly borne, and that as a rule, great poorness of diet will only come when other privations have preceded it. Long before insufficiency of diet is a matter of hygienic concern, long before the physiologist would think of counting the grains of nitrogen and carbon which intervene between life and starvation, the household will have been utterly destitute of material comfort. Clothing and fuel will have been even scantier than food. Against inclemencies of weather, there will have been no adequate protection. Dwelling space would have been stinted to the degree in which overcrowding produces or increases disease. Of household utensils and furniture, there will have scarcely been any. Even cleanliness will have been found costly or difficult, and if there still be self-respectful endeavors to maintain it, every such endeavor will represent additional pangs of hunger. The home, too, will be where shelter can be cheap as bought, in quarters where commonly there is least fruit of sanitary supervision, least drainage, least scavenging, least suppression of public nuisances, least or worst water supply, and if in town, least light and air. Such are the sanitary dangers to which poverty is almost certainly exposed, when it is poverty enough to imply scantiness of food. And while the sum of them is of terrible magnitude against life, the mere scantiness of food is in itself a very serious moment. These are painful reflections, especially when it is remembered that the poverty to which they advert is not the deserved poverty of idleness. In all cases, it is the poverty of working populations. Indeed, as regards the indoor operatives, the work which obtains the scanty pittance of food is for the most part excessively prolonged. Yet evidently, it is only in a qualified sense that the work can be deemed self-supporting. And on a very large scale, the nominal self-support can only be a circuit longer or shorter to pauperism. The intimate connection between the pangs of hunger suffered by the most industrious layers of the working class and the extravagant consumption, coarse or refined, of the rich, for which capitalist accumulation is the basis, is only uncovered when the economic laws are known. It is otherwise with the housing situation. Every unprejudiced observer sees that the greater the centralization of the means of production, the greater is the corresponding concentration of workers within a given space. And therefore, the more quickly capitalist accumulation takes place, the more miserable the housing situation of the working class. Improvements of towns which accompany the increase of wealth, such as the demolition of badly built districts, the erection of palaces to house banks, warehouses, etc., the widening of streets for business traffic, for luxury carriages, for the introduction of tramways, obviously drive the poor away into even worse and more crowded corners. On the other hand, everyone knows that the dearness of houses stands in inverse ratio to their quality, and that the mines of misery are exploited by house speculators with more profit and at less cost than the mines of Potosi were ever exploited. The antagonistic character of capitalist accumulation, and thus of capitalist property relations in general, is here so evident that even the official English reports on this subject teem with heterodox onslaughts on property and its rights. 
This evil makes such progress alongside the development of industry, the accumulation of capital, and the growth and improvement of towns that the sheer fear of contagious diseases, which do not spare even respectable people, brought into existence from 1847 to 64 no less than ten acts of parliament on sanitation, and that the frightened middle classes in certain towns, such as Liverpool, Glasgow, and so on, took strenuous measures to deal with the problem through their municipalities. Nevertheless, Dr. Simon says in his report of 1865, quote, Speaking generally, it may be said that the evils are uncontrolled in England. By order of the Privy Council, in 1864, an inquiry was made into the conditions of the housing of the agricultural laborers, and in 1865 the same thing was done for the poorer classes of the towns. The results of the admirable work of Dr. Julian Hunter are to be found in the 7th and 8th reports on public health. I shall come back to the agricultural laborers later on. On the condition of urban dwellings, I quote, as a preliminary, a general remark made by Dr. Simon. Although my official point of view, he says, is one exclusively physical, common humanity requires that the other aspect of this evil should not be ignored. In its higher degrees, overcrowding almost necessarily involves such negation of all delicacy, such unclean confusion of bodies and bodily functions, such an exposure of animal and sexual nakedness as is rather bestial than human. To be subject to these influences is a degradation which must become deeper and deeper for those on whom it continues to work. To children who are born under its curse, it must often be a very baptism into infamy. And beyond all measure, hopeless is the wish that persons thus circumstanced should ever in other aspects aspire to that atmosphere of civilization which has its essence in physical and moral cleanliness. London takes the first place in overcrowded habitations, absolutely unfit for human beings. I feel clear, says Dr. Hunter, on two points. First, that there are about 20 large colonies in London of about 10,000 persons each, whose miserable condition exceeds almost anything I have seen elsewhere in England, and is almost entirely the result of their bad house accommodation. And second, that the overcrowded and dilapidated condition of the houses of these colonies is much worse than was the case 20 years ago. It is not too much to say that life in parts of London and Newcastle is infernal. Furthermore, the better-off part of the working class, together with the small shopkeepers and other elements of the lower middle class, falls in London more and more under the curse of these vile housing conditions, in proportion as improvements, and with them the demolition of old streets and houses, advance, in proportion as factories spring up, and the influx of people into the metropolis grows, and finally in proportion as house rents rise owing to increases in urban ground rent. Quote, rents have become so heavy that few laboring men can afford more than one room. There is almost no house property in London that is not overburdened with a number of middlemen, for the price of land in London is always very high in comparison with its yearly revenue, and therefore every buyer speculates on getting rid of it again at a jury price the expropriation valuation fixed by jurymen, or on pocketing an extraordinary increase of value arising from the proximity of some large-scale undertaking. As a result of this, there is a regular trade in the purchase of fag ends of leases. Quote, Gentlemen in this business may be fairly expected to do as they do, get all they can from the tenants while they have them, and leave as little as they can for their successors. The rents are weekly, and these gentlemen run no risk. Owing to the construction of railways within the city, quote, the spectacle has lately been seen in the east of London of a number of families wandering about some Saturday night with their scanty worldly goods on their backs without any resting place but the working house. The workhouses are already overcrowded, and the improvements already sanctioned by Parliament have only just begun. If the workers are driven away by the demolition of their old houses, they either do not leave the old parish, or at the most they settle down on its borders, as near as they can get to it. Quote, they try, of course, to remain as near as possible to their workshops. The inhabitants do not go beyond the same or the next parish, parting their two-room tenements into single rooms and crowding even those. Even at an advanced rent, the people who are displaced will hardly be able to get an accommodation so good as the meager one they have left. Half the workmen of the Strand walk two miles to their work. This same strand, a main thoroughfare which gives strangers an imposing idea of the wealth of London, may serve as an example of the way human beings are packed together in that city. In one of its parishes, the public health officer reckoned 581 persons per acre, although half the width of the Thames was included in the parish. It'll of course be understood that all the measures for the improvement of public health which have been taken so far in London have in fact, by demolishing uninhabitable houses, driven the workers out of some districts only to crowd them together still more closely in other districts. 
either, says Dr. Hunter. The whole proceeding will of necessity stop as an absurdity, or the public compassion be effectually aroused to the obligation, which may now be, without exaggeration, called national, of supplying cover to those who will provide it for them. Capitalist justice is truly to be wondered at. The owner of land and houses, the businessman, when expropriated by improvements such as railways, the building of new streets, etc., does not just receive full compensation. He must also be comforted, both according to human law and divine law, by receiving a substantial profit in return for his compulsory abstinence. The worker, with his wife and child and chattels, is thrown out into the street, and if he crowds in too large numbers near districts where the local authority insists on decency, he is prosecuted in the name of public health. Except London. There was at the beginning of the 19th century no single town in England of more than 100,000 inhabitants. Only five had more than 50,000. Now, there are 28 towns with more than 50,000 inhabitants. Quote, the result of this change is not only that the class of town people is enormously increased, but the old close-packed little towns are now centers built round on every side, open nowhere to air, and being no longer agreeable to the rich are abandoned by them for the pleasanter outskirts. The successors of these rich are occupying the larger houses at the rate of a family to each room and find accommodation for two or three lodgers, and a population for which the houses were not intended and quite unfit has been created, whose surroundings are truly degrading to the adults and ruinous to the children. The more rapidly capital accumulates in an industrial or commercial town, the more rapidly flows the stream of exploitable human material, the more miserable are the impoverished dwellings of the workers. Newcastle on Tyne, as the center of a coal and iron district, which is becoming more and more productive, takes second place after London in the housing inferno. Not less than 34,000 persons live there in single rooms. Because of their absolute danger to the community, houses in great numbers have recently been pulled down by the authorities in Newcastle and Gateshead. The building of new houses progresses very slowly, business very quickly. The town was therefore more full than ever in 1865. There was scarcely a room to let. Dr. Embleton of the Newcastle Fever Hospital says, quote, There can be little doubt that the great cause of the continuance and the spread of the typhus has been the overcrowding of human beings and the uncleanliness of their dwellings. The rooms in which laborers in many cases live are situated in confined and unwholesome yards or courts, and for space, light, air, and cleanliness are models of insufficiency and insalubrity and a disgrace to any civilized community. In them, men, women, and children lie at night huddled together, and as regards the men, the night shift succeed the day shift, and the day shift the night shift, in an unbroken series for some time together, the beds having scarcely time to cool, the whole house badly supplied with water and worse with privies, dirty, unventilated, and pestiferous. The price per week of such lodgings ranges from eight pence to three shillings. The town of Newcastle on Tyne, says Dr. Hunter, contains a sample of the finest tribe of our countrymen, often sunk by external circumstances of house and street into an almost savage degradation. As a result of the ebb and flow of capital and labor, the state of the dwellings of an industrial town may today be tolerable, tomorrow frightful, or the local magistracy of the town may have summoned up the energy to remove the most shocking abuses. The next day, masses of ragged Irishmen or decayed English agricultural laborers may come crowding in, like a swarm of locusts. They are stowed away in cellars and lofts, where a hitherto respectable working-class dwelling is transformed into a lodging house whose personnel changes as quickly as soldiers' quarters in the Thirty Years' War. Take Bradford, for example. There, the municipal Philistine had just been engaged in making improvements to the town. Besides, there were still 1,751 uninhabited houses in Bradford in 1861. But now comes that revival of trade which the sweet-natured liberal Mr. Forster, the Negro's friend, recently crowed over so gracefully. With the revival of trade, there naturally occurred an overflow from the wages of the ever-fluctuating reserve army or relative surplus population. The frightful cellar habitations and rooms registered in the list, which Dr. Hunter obtained from an agent of an insurance company, were for the most part inhabited by well-paid workers. They declared that they would willingly pay for better dwellings if they were to be had. Meanwhile, they become degraded and fall ill, every man jack of them, while that sweet-natured liberal, Mr. Forster, M.P., sheds tears of joy over the blessings of free trade and profits of the eminent men of Bradford who deal in worsted. In the report of the 5th of September, 1865, Dr. Bell, one of the poor law doctors of Bradford, ascribes the frightful mortality of fever patients in his district to the conditions in which they live, 
Quote, in one small cellar measuring 1,500 cubic feet, there are 10 persons. Vincent Street, Green Air Place, and the Lays included 223 houses having 1,450 inhabitants, 453 beds, and 36 privies. The beds, and in that term I include any roll of dirty old rags or an armful of shavings, have an average of 3.3 persons to each. Many have five and six persons to each, and some people, I am told, are absolutely without beds. They sleep in their ordinary clothes on the bare boards. Young men and women, married and unmarried, all together. I need scarcely add that many of these dwellings are dark, damp, dirty, stinking holes, utterly unfit for human habitations. They are the centers from which disease and death are distributed amongst those in better circumstances, who have allowed them thus to fester in our midst. Bristol takes the third place after London in the misery of its dwellings. Bristol, where the blankest poverty and domestic misery abound in the wealthiest town of Europe. Subsection C. The Nomadic Population We now turn to a group of people whose origin is rural, but whose occupation is for the most part industrial. They are the light infantry of capital, thrown from one point to another according to its present needs. When they are not on the march, they camp. Nomadic labor is used for various building and draining works for brick-making, lime-burning, railway-making, etc. A flying column of pestilence, it carries smallpox, typhus, cholera, and scarlet fever into the places in whose neighborhood it pitches its camp. In undertakings which involve a large outlay of capital, such as railways, etc., the contractor himself generally provides his army with wooden huts and so on. Thus improvising villages which lack all sanitary arrangements are outside the control of the local authorities and are very profitable to the gentleman who is doing the contracting, for he exploits his workers in two directions at once, as soldiers of an industry and as tenants. Depending on whether the wooden hut contains one, two, or three holes, its inhabitant, the navvy or whatever he may be, has to pay two, three, or four shillings a week. One example will suffice. Dr. Simon reports that in September of 1864, the chairman of the Nuisances Removal Committee of the parish of Sevenoaks sent the following denunciation to Sir George Gray, the Home Secretary. Quote, Smallpox cases were rarely heard of in this parish until about 12 months ago. Shortly before that time, the works for a railway from Lewisham to Tunbridge were commenced here, and in addition to the principal works being in the immediate neighborhood of this town, there was also established the depot for the whole of the works, so that a large number of persons was of necessity employed here. As cottage accommodation could not be attained for them all, huts were built in several places along the line of the works by the contractor Mr. J for their especial occupation. These huts possessed no ventilation nor drainage, and besides were necessarily overcrowded, because each occupant had to accommodate lodgers, whatever the number in his own family might be, although there were only two rooms to each tenement. The consequences were, according to the medical report we received, that in the night time these poor people were compelled to endure all the horror of suffocation to avoid the pestiferous smells arising from the filthy stagnant water and the privies close under the windows. Complaints were at length made to the Nuisances Removal Committee by a medical gentleman who had occasion to visit these huts, and he spoke of their condition as dwellings in the most severe terms, and he expressed his fears that some very serious consequences might ensue unless some sanitary measures were adopted. About a year ago, Mr. J promised to appropriate a hut to which persons in his employ who were suffering from contagious diseases might at once be removed. He repeated that promise on the 23rd of July last, but although since the date of the last promise there have been several cases of smallpox in his huts and two deaths from the same disease, yet he has taken no steps whatever to carry out his promise. On the 9th of September instant, Mr. Kelson, surgeon, reported to me further cases of smallpox in the same huts, and he described their condition as most disgraceful. I should add for the minister's information that an isolated house called the Pest House, which is set apart for parishioners who might be suffering from infectious diseases, has been continually occupied by such patients for many months past, and is also now occupied, that in one family, five children died from smallpox and fever, that from the 1st of April to the 1st of September this year, a period of five months, there have been no fewer than ten deaths from smallpox in the parish, four of them being in the huts already referred to, that it is impossible to ascertain the exact number of persons who have suffered from that disease, although they are known to be many from the fact of the families keeping it as private as possible. Workers in coal and other mines belong to the best paid categories of the British proletariat. The price that they pay for their wages was shown on an earlier page. Here I shall merely glance at their housing conditions. 
As a rule, the exploiter of a mine, whether he is the proprietor or a tenant, builds a number of cottages for his hands. They receive cottages and coal for firing for nothing, i.e. these form a part of their wages, paid in kind. Those who cannot be housed in this way receive in compensation four pounds per annum. The mining districts rapidly attract a large population, made up of the miners themselves and the artisans, shopkeepers, etc., who group themselves around them. The ground rent is high, as it is generally where population is dense. The mining employer therefore tries to put up, within the smallest space possible, at the entrance to the pit, exactly the number of cottages necessary to pack together his workers and their families. If new mines are opened in the neighborhood, or old ones are again set working, the pressure increases. In the construction of the cottages, only one point of view is of significance, the abstinence of the capitalist from all expenditure that is not absolutely unavoidable. Quote, the lodging which is obtained by the pitmen and other laborers connected with the collieries of Northumberland and Durham, says Dr. Julian Hunter, is perhaps, on the whole, the worst and the dearest of which any large specimens can be found in England, the similar parishes of Monmouthshire excepted. The extreme badness is in the high number of men found in one room, in the smallness of the ground plot on which a great number of houses are thrust, the want of water, the absence of privies, and the frequent placing of one house on top of another, or distribution into flats. The lessee acts as if the whole colony were encamped, not resident. In pursuance of my instructions, says Dr. Stevens, I visited most of the large colliery villages in the Durham Union. With very few exceptions, the general statement that no means are taken to secure the health of the inhabitants would be true of all of them. All colliers are bound, bound, an expression which, like bondage, dates from the age of serfdom, to the colliery lessee or owner for twelve months. If the colliers express discontent or in any way annoy the viewer, a mark of memorandum is made against their names, and at the annual binding such men are turned off. It appears to me that no part of the truck system could be worse than what obtains in these densely populated districts. The collier is bound to take, as part of his hiring, a house surrounded with pestiferous influences. He cannot help himself, and it appears doubtful whether anyone else can help him except his proprietor. He is, to all intents and purposes, a serf, and his proprietor first consults his balance sheet, and the result is tolerably certain. The collier is also often supplied with water by the proprietor, which, whether it be good or bad, he has to pay for or rather he suffers a deduction from his wages. In a conflict with public opinion, or even with the officers of health, capital has no difficulty in justifying the partly dangerous and partly degrading conditions to which it confines the working and domestic life of the mine worker, on the ground that they are necessary for profitable exploitation. It is the same thing when capital abstains from protective measures against dangerous machinery in the factory, from safety appliances and means of ventilation in the mines, and so on. It is the same here with the housing of the miners. Dr. Simon, medical officer of the Privy Council, says in his official report, quote, In apology for the wretched household accommodation, it is alleged that mines are commonly worked on lease, that the duration of the lessee's interest, which in collieries is commonly for 21 years, is not so long that he should deem it worth his while to create good accommodation for his laborers and for the tradespeople and others whom the work attracts that even if he were disposed to act liberally in the matter, this disposition would commonly be defeated by his landlord's tendency to fix on him as ground rent an exorbitant additional charge, for the privilege of having on the surface of the ground the decent and comfortable village which the laborers of the subterranean property ought to inhabit, and the prohibitory price, if not actual prohibition, equally excludes others who might desire to build. It would be foreign to the purpose of this report to enter upon any discussion of the merits of the above apology, nor here is it even needful to consider where it would be that, if decent accommodation were provided, the cost would eventually fall, whether on landlord or lessee or labor or public. But in presence of such shameful facts as are vouched for in the annexed reports, those of Dr. Hunter, Dr. Stevens, etc., a remedy may well be claimed. Claims of landlordship are being so used as to do great public wrong. The landlord, in his capacity as mine owner, invites an industrial colony to labor on his estate, and then in his capacity of surface owner, makes it impossible that the labors whom he collects should find proper lodging where they must live. The lessee, the capitalist exploiter of the mine, meanwhile has no pecuniary motive for resisting that division of the bargain, well knowing that if its latter conditions be exorbitant, the consequences fall not on him, that his laborers, on whom they fall, have not education enough to know the value of their sanitary rights, that neither obscenest lodging nor foulest drinking water will be appreciable inducements towards a strike. Subsection D. 
Effect of Crises on the Best Paid Section of the Working Class Before I turn to the agricultural laborers, I shall just show by one example how crises have an impact even on the best paid section of the working class, on its aristocracy. It'll be remembered that the year 1857 brought one of the gigantic crises with which the industrial cycle always terminates. The next crisis was due in 1866. Already discounted in the actual factory districts by the cotton famine, which threw much capital from its accustomed sphere into great centers of the money market, the crisis assumed this time a predominantly financial character. Its outbreak in May of 1866 was signaled by the failure of a giant London bank, immediately followed by the collapse of countless swindling companies. One of the great London branches of industry involved in the catastrophe was iron shipbuilding. The magnates of this trade had not only overproduced beyond all measure during the swindling period, but they had, apart from this, entered into enormous contracts on the speculative assumption that credit would be forthcoming to an equivalent extent. The terrible reaction then set in, which continues even now, at the end of March 1867, both in shipbuilding and in other London industries. Let me characterize the situation of the workers by quoting the following from a very detailed report by a correspondent of the Morning Star, who visited the chief centers of distress at the end of 1866 and the beginning of 1867. Quote, In the east districts of Poplar, Millwall, Greenwich, Deptford, Limehouse, and Canningtown, at least 15,000 workmen and their families were in a state of utter destitution, and 3,000 skilled mechanics were breaking stones in the workhouse yard after distress of over half a year's duration. I had great difficulty in reaching the workhouse door, for a hungry crowd besieged it. They were waiting for their tickets, but the time had not yet arrived for the distribution. The yard was a great square place with an open shed running all round it, and several large heaps of snow covered the paving stones in the middle. In the middle also were little wicker fence spaces, like sheep pens, where in finer weather the men worked. But on the day of my visit, the pens were so snowed up that nobody could sit in them. Men were busy, however, in the open shed breaking paving stones into macadam. Each man had a big paving stone for a seat, and he chipped away at the rime-covered granite until he had broken up, and think, five bushels of it. And then he had done his day's work and got his day's pay. Three pence and an allowance of food. In another part of the yard was a rickety little wooden house, and when we opened the door of it, we found it filled with men who were huddled together shoulder to shoulder for the warmth of one another's bodies and breath. They were picking oakum and disputing the while as to which could work the longest on a given quantity of food for endurance was the point of honor. Seven thousand in this one workhouse were recipients of relief. Many hundreds of them, it appeared, were six or eight months ago earning the highest wages paid to artisans. Their number would be more than doubled by the count of those who, having exhausted all their savings, still refuse to apply to the parish because they have a little left to pawn. Leaving the workhouse, I took a walk through the streets, mostly of little one-story houses, that abound in the neighborhood of Poplar. My guide was a member of the Committee of the Unemployed. My first call was on an iron worker who had been seven and twenty weeks out of employment. I found the man with his family sitting in a little back room. The room was not bare of furniture and there was a fire in it. This was necessity to keep the naked feet of the young children from getting frostbitten, for it was a bitterly cold day. On a tray in front of the fire lay a quantity of oakum, which the wife and children were picking in return for their allowance from the parish. The man worked in the stone yard of the workhouse for a certain ration of food, and three pence per day. He had now come home to dinner quite hungry, as he told us with a melancholy smile, and his dinner consisted of a couple slices of bread and dripping and a cup of milkless tea. The next door at which we knocked was opened by a middle-aged woman who, without saying a word, led us into a little back parlor in which sat all her family, silent and fixedly staring at a rapidly dying fire. Such desolation, such hopelessness was about these people in their little room as I would not care to witness again. Nothing they have done, sir, said the woman, pointing to her boys, for six and twenty weeks, and all our money gone, all the twenty pounds that me and father saved when times were better, thinking it would yield a little to keep us when we got past work. Look at it, she said almost fiercely, bringing out a bank book with all its well-kept entries of money paid in and money taken out, so that we could see how the little fortune had begun with the first five-shilling deposit and had grown by little and little to be twenty pounds, and how it had melted down again till the sum in hand got from pounds to shillings, and the last entry made the book as worthless as a blank sheet. This family received relief from the workhouse, and it furnished them with just one scanty meal per day. Our next visit was to an iron laborer's wife, whose husband worked in the yards. We found her ill from want of food, lying on a mattress in her clothes, and just covered with a strip of carpet, for all the bedding had been pawned. Two wretched children were tending her, themselves looking as much in need of nursing as their mother. 
Nineteen weeks of enforced idleness had brought them to this pass, and while the mother told the history of that bitter past, she moaned as if all her faith in a future that should atone for it were dead. On getting outside, a young fellow came running after us and asked us to step inside his house and see if anything could be done for him. A young wife, two pretty children, a cluster of pawn tickets, and a bare room were all that he had to show. On the afterpains of the crisis of 1866, we shall quote an extract from a Tory newspaper. It must not be forgotten that the east end of London, which is dealt with here, is not only the location of the iron shipbuilding mentioned above, but also of the so-called domestic industry, which has always paid less than the minimum wage. Quote, A frightful spectacle was to be seen yesterday in one part of the metropolis. Although the unemployed thousands of the east end did not parade with their black flags en masse, the human torrent was imposing enough. Let us remember what these people suffer. They are dying of hunger. This is the simple and terrible fact. There are 40,000 of them. In our presence, in one quarter of this wonderful metropolis, are packed, next door to the most enormous accumulation of wealth the world ever saw, cheek by jowl with this, are 40,000 helpless, starving people. These thousands are now breaking in upon the other quarters. Always half-starving, they cry their misery in our ears. They cry to heaven. They tell us from their miserable dwellings that it is impossible for them to find work and useless for them to beg. The local ratepayers themselves are driven by the parochial charges to the verge of pauperism. As is the fashion amongst English capitalists to quote Belgium as the worker's paradise because freedom of labor, or what is the same thing freedom of capital, is there limited neither by the despotism of the trade unions nor by the shackles of the factory acts. We shall say a word or two here about the good fortune of the Belgian worker. Assuredly, no one was more thoroughly initiated into the mysteries of this good fortune than the late Monsieur Duc Pétion, Inspector General of the Belgian Prisons and Charitable Institutions, and member of the Central Statistical Commission of Belgium. Let us take his work, The Economic Budgets of the Working Classes of Belgium, published in Brussels in 1855. Here we find, among other things, a discussion of a normal Belgian worker's family, whose yearly income and expenditure he calculates on very exact data, and whose conditions of nourishment are then compared with those of the soldier, the sailor, and the prisoner. The family consists of father, mother, and four children. Of these six persons, four may be usefully employed the whole year through. It is assumed that there is no sick person among them or anyone incapable of work, nor are there expenses for religious, moral, and intellectual purposes, except a very small sum for church pews nor contributions to savings banks or benefit societies, nor expenses due to luxury or the result of improvidence. The father and the eldest son, however, allow themselves the use of tobacco, and on Sundays go to the Yale House, for which a whole 86 cent times a week are reckoned. Quote, From a general compilation of wages allowed to workers in different trades, it follows that the highest average daily wage is 1 franc 56 cent times for men, 89 cent times for women, 56 cent times for boys, and 55 cent times for girls. Calculated at this rate, the resources of the family would amount, at the maximum, to 1,068 francs a year. In the family taken as typical, we have calculated all possible resources. In ascribing wages to the mother of the family, however, we thereby remove the household from her management. But who will look after the house and the young children? Who will prepare the meals, do the washing and mending? This is the dilemma presented every day to the workers. We see that few workers' families can reach, we will not say the average of the sailor or soldier, but even that of the prisoner. The general average of the cost of each prisoner in the different prisons during the period of 1847 to 49 has been 63 centimes for all prisons. This figure, compared with that of the daily maintenance of the worker, shows a difference of 13 centimes. It must be remarked further that if in the prisons it is necessary to set down in the account the expenses of administration and surveillance, on the other hand, the prisoners do not have to pay for their lodgings. How does it happen, then? that a great number, we might say the great majority of workers, live even more economically than prisoners. It is because they adopt expedients whose secrets are only known by the workers. They reduce their daily rations, they substitute rye bread for wheat, they eat less meat, or even none at all, and the same with butter and condiments. They content themselves with one or two rooms where the family is crammed together, where boys and girls sleep side by side, often on the same mattress. They economize on clothing, washing, and decency. They give up the diversions of Sunday. In short, they resign themselves to the most painful privations. Once this extreme limit has been reached, the least rise in the price of food, the shortest stoppage of work, the slightest illness, increases the worker's distress and brings him to complete disaster. 
Debts accumulate. Credit fails. The most necessary clothes and furniture are pawned. And finally, the family asks to be enrolled on the list of paupers. In fact, in this paradise for capitalists, the smallest change in the prices of the most essential means of subsistence is followed by a change in the number of deaths and crimes. There are 930,000 families in Belgium, of whom, according to the official statistics, 90,000 are wealthy and on the list of voters, i.e. 450,000 persons. 390,000 families of the lower middle class in towns and villages, the greater part of them constantly sinking into the proletariat, i.e. 1.95 million persons. Finally, 450,000 working-class families, i.e. 2.25 million persons, of whom the model ones enjoy the good fortune depicted by Duc Petiot. Of the 450,000 working-class families, over 200,000 are on the pauper list. Subsection E. The British Agricultural Proletariat Nowhere does the antagonistic character of capitalist production and accumulation assert itself more brutally than in the progress of English agriculture, including cattle breeding and the retrogression of the English agricultural laborer. Before I turn to his present situation, a rapid look back. Modern agriculture dates in England from the middle of the 18th century, although the revolution in property relations on the land, which is the basis of the altered mode of production, occurred much earlier. If we take the statements of Arthur Young, a careful observer, though a superficial thinker, about the agricultural labor of 1771, the latter plays a very pitiable role as compared with his predecessor at the end of the 14th century, quote, when the laborer could live in plenty and accumulate wealth. Not to speak of the 15th century, quote, the golden age of the English laborer in town and country. We need not, however, go back as far as that. In a very instructive book produced in 1777, we read, quote, the great farmer is nearly mounted to a level with the gentleman while the poor laborer is depressed almost to the earth. His unfortunate situation will fully appear by taking a comparative view of it only 40 years ago, and at present, landlord and tenant have both gone hand in hand in keeping the laborer down. It is then proved in detail that real agricultural wages fell by nearly one quarter, or 25%, between 1737 and 1777. Modern policy, as Dr. Richard Price was saying at the same time, is indeed more favorable to the higher classes of people, and the consequences may in time prove that the whole kingdom will consist only of gentry and beggars, or of grandees and slaves. Nevertheless, the position of the English agricultural laborer from 1770 to 1780, with respect to his food and dwelling, as well as his self-respect, amusements, etc., is an ideal never attained again since that time. His average wage, expressed in pints of wheat, was, from 70 to 71, 90 pints. In Eden's time being 97, only 65, and in 1808, 60. The state of the agricultural laborer at the end of the anti-Jacobin War, during which landed proprietors, farmers, manufacturers, merchants, bankers, stockbrokers, army contractors, and so on, enriched themselves to such an enormous extent, has already been indicated above. The nominal wage rose, partly as a result of the depreciation of banknotes and partly owing to a rise in the prices of the primary means of subsistence which occurred independently of this depreciation. But the real movement of wages can be demonstrated quite simply, without entering into details that are unnecessary here. The poor law was the same, and was administered in the same way in 1795 and 1814. It'll be remembered how this law was put into effect in the country districts, in the form of alms, the parish made up the nominal wage to the nominal sum required for the simple vegetation of the laborer. The ratio between the wage paid by the farmer and the wage deficit made good by the parish shows us two things. First, the fact that wages had fallen below their minimum. Second, the degree to which the agricultural laborer was a combination of wage laborer and pauper, or the degree to which he had been turned into a serf of his parish. Let us take one county that represents the average situation in all counties. In Northamptonshire in 1795, the average weekly wage was 7 shillings sixpence. The total yearly expenditure of a family of six persons, 36 pounds, 12 shillings, 5 pence. Their total income, 29 pounds, 18 shillings. A deficit made good by the parish of 6 pounds, 14 shillings, and 5 pence. In 1814, in the same county, the weekly wage was 12 shillings, 2 pence. The total yearly expenditure of a family of five persons was 54 pounds, 18 shillings, and 4 pence. Their total income, 36 pounds, and 2 shillings. A deficit made good by the parish of 18 pounds, 6 shillings, and 4 pence. In 1795, the deficit was less than a quarter of the wage. In 1814, it was more than half. It is self-evident that under these circumstances, the meager comforts that Eden still found in the cottage of the agricultural laborer had vanished by 1814. 
of all the animals kept by the farmer, the laborer, that vocal instrument, was thenceforth the most oppressed, the worst nourished, and the most brutally treated. This state of affairs continued quietly until, quote, the swing riots in 1830 revealed to us, i.e. to the ruling classes, by the light of the blazing corn stacks, that misery and black mutinous discontent smoldered quite as fiercely under the surface of agricultural as of manufacturing England. It was at this time that Sadler, in the House of Commons, christened the agricultural laborers white slaves, and a bishop echoed the epithet in the House of Lords. The most notable political economist of that period, E.G. Wakefield, says, quote, the peasant of the south of England is not a freeman, nor is he a slave. He is a pauper. The time just before the repeal of the Corn Laws threw new light on the condition of the agricultural laborers. On the one hand, it was in the interest of the middle-class agitators to prove how little the Corn Laws protected the actual producers of the corn. On the other hand, the industrial bourgeoisie was seething with wrath at the denunciations of the factory system made by the landed aristocracy, at the affectation of sympathy displayed by those utterly corrupt, heartless, and genteel idlers for the woes of the factory workers, and at their diplomatic zeal for factory legislation. There is an old English proverb to the effect that when thieves fall out, honest men come into their own, and in fact, the noisy and passionate dispute between the two factions of the ruling class as to which of them exploited the workers more shamelessly was the midwife of truth on both sides of the question. Earl Shaftesbury, then Lord Ashley, was the protagonist of the aristocratic philanthropic campaign against the factories. He therefore formed a favorite target for the revelations of the Morning Chronicle in 1844 and 45 on the condition of the agricultural laborers. This newspaper, at that time the most important liberal organ, sent special commissioners to the agricultural districts, commissioners who did not content themselves with mere general descriptions and statistics, but published the names both of the families of the laborers examined and of their landlords. The list on the following page gives the wages paid in three villages in the neighborhood of Blanford, Wimborne, and Poole. The villages are the property of Mr. G. Banks and the Earl of Shaftesbury. It'll be noted that just like Banks, the Pope of the Low Church, the head of the English pietists, also pockets a large part of the miserable wages of the laborers under the pretext of the rent of their houses. The repeal of the Corn Laws gave a marvelous impulse to English agriculture. Drainage on the most extensive scale, new methods of stall feeding and the artificial cultivation of green crops, the introduction of mechanical manuring apparatus, the new treatment of clay soils, increased use of mineral manures, employment of the steam engine and all kinds of new machinery, more intensive cultivation in general, are all characteristic of the epoch. Mr. Pusey, chairman of the Royal Agricultural Society, declares that the relative expenses of farming have been reduced by nearly 50% by the introduction of new machinery. On the other hand, the actual productive return of the soil rose rapidly. Greater outlay of capital per acre, and as a consequence, more rapid concentration of farms, were essential conditions of the new method. At the same time, the area under cultivation increased from 1846 to 56 by 464,119 acres, without counting the large part of the eastern counties which was transformed from rabbit warrens and poor pastures into magnificent cornfields. It has already been seen that simultaneously with this, the total number of persons employed in agriculture fell. As far as the actual agricultural laborers of both sexes and all ages are concerned, their number fell from 1.24 million in 1851 to 1.16 million in 1861. The English Register General rightly remarks, quote, The increase of farmers and farm laborers since 1801 bears no kind of proportion to the increase of agricultural produce. And this disproportion is even more noticeable for the last period, when a positive decrease of the agricultural population went hand in hand with an increase in the cultivated area and in the intensity with which it was cultivated, an unheard of accumulation of the capital incorporated with the soil and devoted to its cultivation, an augmentation of the product of the soil unparalleled in the history of English agriculture, abundant rent rolls from the landowners, and growing wealth for the capitalist farmers. If we take this together with the swift, unbroken extension of the market, i.e. the growth of the towns and the reign of free trade, then the agricultural laborer was at last, after so many vicissitudes, placed in circumstances that ought, according to the orthodox rules, to have made him drunk with happiness. But Professor Rogers comes to the conclusion that the situation of the English agricultural laborer of today, in comparison with his predecessor from 1770 to 80, not to speak of his predecessor in the last half of the 14th and in the 15th century, has changed for the worse to an extraordinary extent, that the peasant has again become a serf, and a serf worse fed and worse clothed. Dr. Julian Hunter, in his epoch-making report on the dwellings of the agricultural laborers, says, quote, The cost of the hind, 
a name for the agricultural laborer inherited from the time of serfdom, is fixed at the lowest possible amount on which he can live. The supplies of wages and shelter are not calculated on the profit to be derived from him. He is a zero in a farming calculation. The means of subsistence are always supposed to be a fixed quantity. As to any further reduction of his income, he may say, I have nothing and I do not care about anything. He has no fears for the future because he has now only the bare supply necessary to keep him. He has reached the zero from which are dated the calculations of the farmer. Come what will, he has no share either in prosperity or adversity. In the year 1863, an official inquiry took place into the conditions of nourishment and work of the criminals condemned to transportation and penal servitude. The results are recorded in two voluminous blue books. Among other things, it is said, quote, From an elaborate comparison between the diet of convicts and the convict prisons in England, and that of paupers in workhouses and of free laborers in the same country, it certainly appears that the former are much better fed than either of the two other classes, while the amount of labor required from an ordinary convict under penal servitude is about one half of what would be done by an ordinary day laborer. Here are a few characteristic depositions of witnesses. Number 5056, quote, The diet of the English prisons is superior to that of ordinary laborers in England. Number 5075, It is the fact that the ordinary agricultural laborers in Scotland very seldom get any meat at all. Number 3047, is there anything that you are aware of to account for the necessity of feeding them very much better than ordinary laborers? Certainly not. Number 3048. Do you think that further experiments ought to be made in order to ascertain whether a dietary might not be hit upon for prisoners employed on public works nearly approaching to the dietary of free laborers? The agricultural laborer might say, I work hard and have not enough to eat, and therefore it is better for me to be in prison again than here. From the tables appended to the first volume of the report, I have compiled this comparative summary. The general result of the inquiry by the Medical Commission of 1863 into the state of nourishment for the worst-fed classes of the people is already known to the reader. He will remember that the diet of a great part of the families of agricultural laborers is below the minimum necessary, quote, to avert starvation diseases. This is especially the case in all the purely rural districts of Cornwall, Devon, Somerset, Wiltshire, Staffordshire, Oxfordshire, Berkshire, and Hertfordshire. The nourishment obtained by the laborer himself, says Dr. E. Smith, is larger than the average quantity indicates, since he eats a larger share, necessary to enable him to perform his labor, of food than the other members of his family, including in the poorer districts nearly all the meat and bacon. The quantity of food obtained by the wife and also by the children at the period of rapid growth is in many cases, in almost every county, deficient, and particularly deficient in nitrogen. The male and female servants who live with the farmers themselves are sufficiently nourished. Their number fell from 288,277 in 1851 to 204,962 in 1861. The labor of women in the fields, says Dr. Smith, whatever may be its disadvantages, is under present circumstances of great advantage to the family, since it adds to that amount of income which provides shoes and clothing and pays the rent, and thus enables the family to be better fed. One of the most remarkable findings of the inquiry was that the agricultural labor of England, as compared with other parts of the United Kingdom, is considerably the worst fed, as the appended table shows. Quote, to the insufficient quantity and miserable quality of the house accommodation generally had by our agricultural laborers, says Dr. Simon in his official health report, almost every page of Dr. Hunter's report bears testimony. And gradually, for many years past, the state of the laborer in these respects has been deteriorating, house room now being greatly more difficult for him to find, and when found, greatly less suitable to his needs than perhaps for centuries had been the case. Especially within the last twenty or thirty years, the evil has been in very rapid increase, and the household circumstances of the laborer are now in the highest degree deplorable, except in so far as they whom his labor enriches see fit to treat him with a kind of pitiful indulgence, he is quite peculiarly helpless in the matter. Whether he shall find house room on the land which he contributes to till, whether the house room which he gets shall be human or swinish, whether he shall have the little space of garden that so vastly lessens the pressure of his poverty, all this does not depend on his willingness and ability to pay reasonable rent for the decent accommodation he requires, but depends on the use which others may see fit to make of their right to do as they will with their own. However large may be a farm, there is no law that a certain proportion of laborers' dwellings, much less of decent dwellings, shall be upon it, nor does any law reserve for the laborer ever so little right in that soil to which his industry is as needful as sun and rain. An extraneous element weighs the balance heavily against him, the influence of the poor law in its provisions concerning settlement and chargeability, 
Under this influence, each Paris has a pecuniary interest in reducing to a minimum the number of its resident laborers. For unhappily, agricultural labor, instead of implying a safe and permanent independence for the hard-working laborer and his family, implies for the most part only a longer, shorter circuit to eventual pauperism. A pauperism which, during the whole circuit, is so near that any illness or temporary failure of occupation necessitates immediate recourse to parochial relief, and thus all residents of agricultural population in a parish as glaringly in addition to its poor rates. Large proprietors have but to resolve that there shall be no laborers' dwellings on their estates, and their estates will thenceforth be virtually free from half their responsibility for the poor. How far it has been intended, in the English constitution and law, that this kind of unconditional property and land should be acquirable, and that a landlord, doing as he wills with his own, should be able to treat the cultivators of the soil as aliens, whom he may expel from his territory, is a question which I do not pretend to discuss. For that power of eviction does not exist only in theory. On a very large scale, it prevails in practice, prevails as a main governing condition in the household circumstances of the agricultural laborer. As regards the extent of the evil, it may suffice to refer to the evidence which Dr. Hunter has compiled from the last census, that destruction of houses, notwithstanding increased local demands for them, had during the last ten years been in progress in 821 separate parishes or townships of England, so that irrespectively of persons who had been forced to become non-resident, that is, in the parishes in which they work, these parishes and townships were receiving in 1861, as compared with 51, a population five and one-thirds percent greater into house room four and one-half percent less. When the process of depopulation has completed itself, the result, says Dr. Hunter, is a show village where the cottages have been reduced to a few, and where none but persons who are needed as shepherds, gardeners, or gamekeepers are allowed to live, regular servants who receive the good treatment usual to their class. But the land requires cultivation, and it'll be found that the laborers employed upon it are not tenants of the owner, but that they come from a neighboring open village perhaps three miles off, where a numerous small proprietary had received them when their cottages were destroyed in the close villages around. Where things are tending to the above result, often the cottages which stand testify in their unrepaired and wretched condition to the extinction to which they are doomed. They are seen standing in the various stages of natural decay. While the shelter holds together, the laborer is permitted to rent it, and glad enough he will be to do so, even at the price of decent lodging. But no repair, no improvement shall it receive except such as its penniless occupants can supply. And when at last it becomes quite uninhabitable, uninhabitable even to the humblest standard of serfdom, it'll be but one more destroyed cottage, and future poor rates will be somewhat lightened. While great owners are thus escaping from poor rates through the depopulation of lands over which they have control, the nearest town or open village receives the evicted laborers. The nearest, I say, but this nearest may mean three or four miles distant from the farm where the laborer has his daily toil. To that daily toil there would then have to be added, as if it were nothing, the daily need of walking six or eight miles for power of earning his bread. And whatever farm work is done by his wife and children is done at the same disadvantage. Nor is this nearly all the toil which the distance occasions him. In the open village, cottage speculators buy scraps of land, which they throng as densely as they can with the cheapest of all possible hovels and into those wretched habitations, which, even if they adjoin the open country, have some of the worst features of the town residences, crowd the agricultural labors of England. Nor, on the one hand, must it be supposed that even when the laborer is housed upon the land which he cultivates, his household circumstances are generally such as his life of productive industry would seem to deserve. Even on princely estates, his cottage may be of the meanest descriptions. There are landlords who deem any style good enough for their laborer and his family, and who yet do not disdain to drive him with the hardest possible bargain for rent. It may be but a ruinous one-bedroomed hut, having no fire grate, no privy, no opening window, no water supply but the ditch, no garden, but the laborer is helpless against the wrong. And the nuisance's removal acts are a mere dead letter, in great part dependent for their working on such cottage owners as the one from whom the laborer's hovel is rented. From brighter but exceptional scenes, it is requisite in the interests of justice that attention should again be drawn to the overwhelming preponderance of facts which are a reproach to the civilization of England. Lamentable indeed must be the case when notwithstanding all that is evident with regard to the quality of the present accommodation, it is the common conclusion of competent observers that even the general badness of dwellings is an evil infinitely less urgent than their mere numerical insufficiency.' 
For years, the overcrowding of rural labor's dwellings has been a matter of deep concern, not only to persons who care for sanitary good, but to persons who care for decent and moral life. For again and again, in phrases so uniform that they seem stereotyped, reporters on the spread of epidemic disease in rural districts have insisted on the extreme importance of that overcrowding as an influence which renders it a quite hopeless task to attempt the limiting of any infection which is introduced. And again and again, it has been pointed out that notwithstanding the many salubrious influences which there are in a country life, the crowding which so favors the extension of contagious disease also favors the origination of disease which is not contagious. And those who have denounced the overcrowded state of our rural population have not been silent as to a further mischief. Even where their primary concern has been only with the injury to health, often, almost perforce, they have been referred to other relations on the subject. In showing how frequently it happens that adult persons of both sexes, married and unmarried, are huddled together in single small sleeping rooms, their reports have carried out the conviction that, under the circumstances they describe, decency must always be outraged, and morality almost of necessity must suffer. Thus, for instance, in the appendix of my last annual report, Dr. Ord, reporting on an outbreak of fever at Wing in Buckinghamshire, mentions how a young man who had come thither from Wingrave with fever in the first days of his illness slept in a room with nine other persons. Within a fortnight, several of these persons were attacked, and in the course of a few weeks, five out of the nine had fever, and one died. From Dr. Harvey of St. George's Hospital, who, on private professional business, visited Wing during the time of the epidemic, I received information exactly in the sense of the above report. A young woman having fever lay at night in a room occupied by her father and mother, her bastard child, two young men, her brothers, and her two sisters, each with a bastard child, ten persons in all. A few weeks ago, thirteen persons slept in it. End quote. Dr. Hunter investigated 5,375 agricultural laborers' cottages, not only in the purely agricultural districts, but in all the counties of England. 2,195 out of them had only one bedroom, often used at the same time as a living room, 2,930 only two, and 250 more than two. I give below a short selection of examples gathered from a dozen counties. Example number one, Bedfordshire. Wrestlingworth. Bedrooms about 12 feet long and 10 broad, although many are smaller than this. The small one-storied cots are often divided by partitions into two bedrooms, one bed frequently in a kitchen, 5 feet 6 inches in height. Rent, 3 pounds a year. The tenants have to make their own privies. The landlord only supplies a hole. As soon as one has made a privy, it is made use of by the whole neighborhood. One house, belonging to a family called Richardson, was of quite unapproachable beauty. Quote, its plaster walls bulged like a lady's dress in a curtsy. One gable end was convex, the other concave, and on this last, unfortunately, stood the chimney, a curved tube of clay and wood like an elephant's trunk. A long stick served as a prop to prevent the chimney from falling. The doorway and window were rhomboidal. Of seventeen houses visited, only four had more than one bedroom, and those four overcrowded. The cots with one bedroom sheltered three adults and three children, a married couple with six children, etc., Dunton. High rents from four to five pounds. Weekly wages of the men, ten shillings. They hope to pay the rent by the straw plating of the family. The higher the rent, the greater the number that must work together to pay. Six adults living with four children in one sleeping apartment. Pay three pounds, ten shillings for it. The cheapest house in Dunton, fifteen feet long externally, ten broad, let for three pounds. Only one of the houses investigated had two bedrooms. A little outside the village, a house whose tenants dunged against the house side, the lower nine inches of the door eaten away through sheer rottenness. The doorway, a single opening closed at night by a few bricks, ingeniously pushed up after shutting and covered with some matting. Half a window with glass and frame had gone the way of all flesh. Here, without furniture, huddled together, were three adults and five children. Dunton is not worse than the rest of the Bigglesuede Union. Example 2. Berkshire. Beenham. In June of 1864, a man, his wife, and four children lived in a cot, a one-storied cottage. A daughter came home from service with scarlet fever. She died. One child sickened and died. The mother and one child were down with typhus when Dr. Hunter was called in. The father and one child slept outside, but the difficulty of securing isolation was seen here, for in the crowded market of the miserable village lay the linen of the fever-stricken household, waiting for the wash. The rest of H's house, one shilling a week, one bedroom without a window, fireplace, door, or opening, except into the lobby. No garden. 
A man lived here for a little while with two grown-up daughters and one grown-up son. Father and son slept on the bed, the girls in the passage. Each of the latter had a child while the family was living here, but one went to the workhouse for her confinement and then came home. Example 3. Buckinghamshire. Thirty cottages on 1,000 acres of land contained here about 130 to 140 persons. The parish of Bradenham comprises 1,000 acres. It numbered, in 1851, 36 houses and a population of 84 males and 54 females. This inequality of the sexes was partly remedied in 1861, when they numbered 98 males and 87 females, an increase in 10 years of 14 men and 33 women. Meanwhile, the number of houses had declined by one. Winslow. A great part of this newly built in good style. Demand for houses appears very marked, since very miserable cots let to one shilling to one shilling three pence per week. Water eaten. Here, the landlords, in the view of the increasing population, have destroyed about 20% of the existing houses. A poor laborer, who had to go about four miles to his work, answered the question whether he could not find a cot nearer. Quote, no, they know better than to take a man in with my large family. Tinker's End, near Winslow. A bedroom in which were four adults and four children, 11 feet long, 9 feet broad, 6 feet by 5 inches high at its highest part, another 11 feet 3 inches by 9 feet, 5 feet 10 inches high, sheltered six persons. Each of these families had less space than is considered necessary for a convict. No house had more than one bedroom, not one of them a back door. Water very scarce. Weekly rent from one shillings fourpence to two shillings. In 16 of the houses visited, only one man that earned ten shillings a week. The quantity of air for each person, under the circumstances just described, corresponds to that which he would have if he were shut up in a box of four feet measuring each way the whole night. But then the ancient dens afforded a certain amount of unintentional ventilation. Example 4. Cambridgeshire. Gambling A belongs to several landlords. It contains the wretchedest cots to be found anywhere. Much straw plating. Quote, A deadly lassitude, a hopeless surrendering up to filth, reigns in gambling lay. The neglect in its center becomes mortification at its extremities, north and south, where the houses are rotting to pieces. The absentee landlords bleed this poor rookery too freely. The rents are very high, eight or nine persons packed in one sleeping apartment, in two cases six adults, each with one or two children in one small bedroom. Example 5. Essex. In this county, decline in the number of persons and of cottages goes hand in hand in many parishes. In not less than 22 parishes, however, the destruction of houses has not prevented increase of population, or has not brought about that expulsion which, under the name migration to towns, generally occurs. In Fingringo, a parish of 3,445 acres, there were 145 houses in 1851, and only 110 in 1861. But the people did not wish to go away, and managed even to increase under these circumstances. In 1851, 252 persons inhabited 61 houses, but in 1861, 262 persons were squeezed into 49 houses. In Basildon, in 1851, 157 persons lived on 1,827 acres in 35 houses. At the end of 10 years, 180 persons lived in 27 houses. In the parishes of Fingringo, South Farnbridge, Whitford, Basildon, and Ransden Crags, in 1851, 1,392 persons were living on 8,449 acres in 316 houses. In 1861, on the same area, 1,473 persons in 249 houses. Example 6. Herefordshire. This little county has suffered more from the eviction spirit than any other in England. At Madley, overcrowded cottages generally, with only two bedrooms belonging for the most part to the farmers. They can let them very easily for three pounds or four pounds a year and pay a weekly wage of nine shillings. Example 7. Huntingdonshire. Hartford had, in 1851, 87 houses. Shortly after this, 19 cottages were destroyed in this small parish of 1,720 acres. Population in 1831, 452. In 1851, 832. And in 1861, 341. Fourteen cottages, each with one bedroom, were visited. One of these rooms, in which eight people slept, was 12 feet 10 inches long, 12 feet 2 inches broad, 6 feet 9 inches high. The average, without making any deductions for projections into the apartment, comes to about 130 cubic feet per head. In the fourteen sleeping rooms, 34 adults and 33 children. These cottages are seldom provided with gardens, but many of the inmates are able to farm small allotments at 10 shillings or 12 shillings per rood, which is a quarter acre. These allotments are at a distance from the houses, which are without privies. The family must either go to the allotment to deposit their hors d'oeuvres, or, as happens in this place, if the reader will permit the reference, 
use a closet with a trough set like a drawer in a chest of drawers, and drawn out weekly and conveyed to the allotment to be emptied where its contents were wanted. In Japan, the cyclical movement of the conditions of human life proceeds more cleanly and more decently than this. Example 8. Lincolnshire. Langtoft. A man lives here in Wright's house with his wife, her mother, and five children. The house has a front kitchen, scullery, bedroom over the front kitchen. Front kitchen and bedroom 12 feet 2 inches by 9 feet 5 inches. The whole ground floor 21 feet 2 inches by 9 feet 5 inches. The bedroom is a garret. The walls run together into the roof like a sugar loaf, a dormer window opening in front. Quote, Why did he live here? On account of the garden? No, it is very small. The rent? High. One shilling three pence per week. Near his work? No, six miles away, so that he walks daily to and fro twelve miles. He lived there because it was a tenable cot, end quote, and because he wanted to have a cot for himself alone anywhere, at any price, and in any conditions. The following are the statistics of 12 houses in Langtoft with 12 bedrooms, 38 adults, and 36 children. Example 9. Kent. Kennington, very seriously overpopulated in 1859 when diphtheria appeared and the parish doctor instituted a medical inquiry into the conditions of the poor classes. He found that in this locality, where much labor is employed, various cots had been destroyed and no new ones built. In one district, there stood four houses named bird cages. Each had four rooms of the following dimensions in feet and inches. The kitchen, 9 foot 5 by 8 foot 11 by 6 foot 6. A scullery, 8 foot 6 by 4 foot 6 by 6 foot 6. A bedroom, 8 foot 5 by 5 foot 10 by 6 foot 3. And another bedroom of 8 foot 5 by 8 foot 4 by 6 foot 3. Example 10. Northamptonshire. Brynworth, Pickford, and Floor. In these villages in the winter, 20 to 30 men were lounging about the streets from lack of work. The farmers do not always till the corn and turnip land sufficiently, and the landlord has found it best to throw all his farms together into two or three, hence the shortage of employment. While on one side of the wall the land is crying out to be worked, on the other side the defrauded laborers are casting longing glances at it. Feverishly overworked in the summer and half-starved in the winter, it is no wonder if they say in their own local dialect, the parson and gentlefolk seem frit to death at them. At Floor there are cases, in one bedroom of the smallest size, of couples with four, five, and six children. Three adults with five children, a couple with grandfather and six children down with scarlet fever, etc. In two houses with two bedrooms, two families of eight and nine adults respectively. Example 11. Wiltshire. Stratton. 31 houses visited, eight with only one bedroom. Penn Hill, in the same parish, a cotlet at one shilling three pence a week with four adults and four children. Had nothing good about it except the walls, from the floor of the rough-hewn pieces of stones to the roof of the worn-out thatch. Example 12. Worcestershire. House destruction here not quite so excessive, yet from 1851 to 1861, the number of inhabitants to each house, on the average, has risen from 4.2 to 4.6. Badsy. Many cots and little gardens here. Some of the farmers declare that the cots are a great nuisance here because they bring the poor. In the view of one gentleman, quote, The poor are none the better for them. If you build 500, they will let fast enough. In fact, the more you build, the more they want. According to him, the houses give birth to the inhabitants, who, then by a law of nature, put pressure on the means of housing. Dr. Hunter remarks, quote, Now these poor must come from somewhere, and as there is no particular attraction, such as doles at Badsey, it must be repulsion from some other unfit place, which will send them here. If each could find an allotment near his work, he would not prefer Badsey where he pays for his scrap of ground twice as much as the farmer pays for his. The continual emigration to the towns, the continual formation of a surplus population in the countryside through the concentration of farms, the conversion of arable land into pasture, the introduction of machinery, etc., are things which go hand in hand with the continual eviction of the agricultural population by the destruction of their cottages. The more empty the district of people, the greater is its relative surplus population. The greater their pressure on the means of employment, the greater is the absolute excess of the agricultural population over the means of housing it, and the greater, therefore, is the local surplus population in the villages and the pestilential herding together of human beings. The creation of dense knots of humanity in scattered little villages and small country towns corresponds to the forcible draining of men from the surface of the land. The continuous conversion of the agricultural laborers into a surplus population, in spite of their diminishing number and the increasing mass of their products, is the cradle of pauperism. The pauperism of the agricultural laborers is ultimately a motive for their eviction, 
It is also the chief source of their miserable housing, which breaks down their last power of resistance and makes them mere slaves of the landed proprietors and the farmers. Thus the minimum of wages becomes a law of nature for them. On the other hand, the land, in spite of its constant relative surplus population, is at the same time underpopulated. This is not only seen locally, at the points where the flow of men to towns, mines, railway constructions, etc. is most marked. It is to be seen everywhere, at harvest time as well as in spring and summer, on those numerous occasions when English agriculture, careful and intensive as it is, needs extra hands. There are always too many agricultural laborers for the ordinary needs of cultivation, and too few for exceptional and temporary requirements. Hence, we find in the official documents contradictory complaints from the same places of a simultaneous deficiency and excess of labor. A temporary and local shortage of labor does not bring about a rise in wages, but rather forces the women and children into the fields, and constantly lowers the age at which exploitation begins. As soon as the exploitation of women and children takes place on a large scale, it becomes in turn a new means of making the male agricultural laborer redundant and keeping down his wage. The finest fruit of this vicious circle thrives in the east of England. This is the so-called gang system to which I must briefly return here. The gang system obtains almost exclusively in the counties of Lincolnshire, Huntingdonshire, Cambridgeshire, Norfolk, Suffolk, and Nottinghamshire, and sporadically in the neighboring counties of Northamptonshire, Bedfordshire, and Rutland. Lincolnshire will serve as an example. A part of this county is new land, formerly marsh or even as in others of the eastern counties just mentioned, recently won from the sea. The steam engine has worked wonders in the way of drainage. What were once fens and sandbanks now bear a luxuriant sea of corn and very high ground rents. The same thing is true of the alluvial lands won by human endeavor, as in the island of Axholm and other parishes on the banks of Trent. Not only were no new cottages built there, but in proportion as the new farms arose, old cottages were demolished, and the supply of labor had to come from open villages miles away, by long roads that wound along the sides of the hills. There alone had the population formerly found shelter from the incessant floods of winter. The laborers who live on the farms of 400 to 1,000 acres, they are called confined laborers, are solely employed on agricultural work which is permanent, difficult, and requires the aid of horses. For every 100 acres there is, on an average, scarcely one cottage. A Fenland farmer, for instance, gave this evidence before the Commission of Inquiry, quote, I farm 320 acres, all arable land. I have not one cottage on my farm. I have only one laborer on my farm now. I have four horsemen lodging about. We get light work done by gangs. The soil requires a great deal of light field labor, such as weeding, hoeing, certain processes of manuring, removing of stones, and so on. This is done by the gangs, or in other words, by the organized bands who live in the open villages. The gang consists of from 10 to 40 or 50 persons, women, young persons of both sexes, 13 to 18 years of age, although the boys are for the most part eliminated at the age of 13 and children of both sexes, 6 to 13 years of age. At the head of the gang is the gang master, always an ordinary agricultural laborer and usually what is called a bad lot, a rake, unsteady, drunken, but with a dash of enterprise and savoir-faire. He is the recruiting sergeant for the gang, which works under him, not under the farmer. He generally negotiates with the latter over piecework, and his income, which on the average is not very much above that of an ordinary agricultural laborer, depends almost entirely on the dexterity with which he manages to extract the greatest possible amount of labor from his gang within the shortest time. The farmers have discovered that women only work steadily under the direction of men, but that women and children, when once set going, spend their vital forces impetuously as Foyer already knew in his time, whereas the adult male worker is shrewd enough to economize on his strength as much as he can. The gang master goes from one farm to another, and thus employs his gang for from six to eight months in the year. Employment by him is therefore much more lucrative and more certain for the laboring families than employment by the individual farmer, who only employs children occasionally. This circumstance so completely rivets his influence in the open villages that children can in general be hired only through his agency. The lending out of the latter, individually and independently of the gang, is a subsidiary trade for him. The drawbacks of this system are the overworking of the children and young persons, the enormous marches that they make every day to and from the farms, which are five, six, and sometimes seven miles away, and finally the demoralization of the gang. Although the gang master, who is called the driver in some districts, is armed with a long stick, he seldom uses it, and complaints of brutal treatment are exceptional. He is a democratic emperor or a kind of Pied Piper of Hamelin. He must therefore be popular with his subjects, and he binds them to himself by the charms of the gypsy life which flourishes under his auspices. Coarse freedom, noisy jollity, and the obscenest kind of impertinence give attractions to the gang. 
Generally, the gang master pays up in a public house, then he returns home with the head of the procession of gang members, reeling drunk, and propped up on either side by a stalwart virago, while children and young persons bring up the rear boisterously and singing mocking and bawdy songs. On the return journey, what Folier calls fanerogami is the order of the day. Girls of 13 and 14 are commonly made pregnant by their male companions of the same age. The open villages, which supply the contingents for the gangs, become Sodoms and Gomorrahs, and have twice as high a rate of illegitimacy as the rest of the kingdom. The moral character of the girls bred in these schools, when they become married women, was shown above. Their children, when opium does not finish them off entirely, are born recruits for the gang. The gang in its classical form, as we have just described it, is called the public, common, or tramping gang, for there also exist private gangs. These are made up in the same way as the common gang, but count fewer members and work not under a gang master, but under some old farm servant, whom the farmer does not know how to employ in any better way. The gypsy fun has vanished in this case, but, according to all the witnesses, the payment and treatment of the children is worse. The gang system, which has steadily expanded during the most recent years, clearly does not exist for the sake of the gang master. It exists for the enrichment of the large-scale farmers, and indirectly for the landowners. For the farmer, there is no more ingenious method of keeping his laborers well below the normal level, and yet of always having an extra hand ready for extra work, of extracting the greatest possible amount of labor with the least possible expenditure of money, and of making adult male labor redundant. From the foregoing exposition, it will be understood why, on the one hand, a greater or lesser lack of employment for the agricultural laborer is admitted, while on the other, the gang system is at the same time declared necessary on account of the shortage of adult male labor and its migration to the towns. The cleanly weeded land and unclean human weeds of Lincolnshire are pole and counterpole of capitalist production. Subsection F. Ireland. In concluding this section, we must travel for a moment to Ireland. First, the main facts of the case. The population of Ireland had, by 1841, grown to 8,222,664. In 1851, it had dwindled to 6.6 .6 million, in 1861 to 5.8 million, and in 1866 to five and one half million, approximately its level in 1801. The decrease in population began with the famine year of 1846, so that Ireland has lost more than five sixteenths of its people in less than 20 years. Total immigration from May of 1851 to July of 1865 numbered 1.59 million. During the years between 1861 and 1865, the immigration was more than half a million. The number of inhabited houses fell from 1851 to 61 by 52,990. From 51 to 61, the number of holdings of from 15 to 30 acres increased by 61,000, that of holdings over 30 acres by 109,000, while the total number of all farms fell by 120,000. This fall was therefore solely due to the suppression of farms of less than 15 acres, in other words, it was due to their centralization. The decrease of the population was naturally accompanied by a decrease in the mass of products. For our purpose, it is sufficient to consider the five years from 1861 to 65, years during which over half a million emigrated and the absolute number of people sank by more than one-third of a million. The following results emerge from the above table. An absolute decrease of 72,358 in the number of horses, an absolute decrease of 116,626 in the number of cattle, an absolute increase of 146,608 in the number of sheep, and an absolute increase of 28,819 in the number of pigs. Let us now return to the produce of agriculture proper, which provides the means of subsistence for cattle and for men. In the following table, we have compared the decrease or increase for each separate year, as compared with its immediate predecessor. The cereal crops include wheat, oats, barley, rye, beans, and peas. The green crops, potatoes, turnips, mangolds, beetroot, cabbages, carrots, parsnips, vetches, etc. See Table B. In the year 1865, 127,470 additional acres came under the heading grassland, chiefly because the area under the heading of unoccupied bog and waste decreased by 101,543 acres. If we compare 1865 with 1864, there was a decrease in cereals of 246,667 quarters, of which 48,999 were wheat, 160,605 oats, 29,892 barley, and so on. The decrease in potatoes was 446,398 tons, although the area of their cultivation increased in 1865. See Table C. From the movement of population and of agricultural production in Ireland, we passed to the movement of the incomes of its landlords, larger farmers and industrial capitalists. This movement is reflected in the rise and fall of the income tax. See Table D. In 
It may be recalled that Schedule D, profits with the exception of those of the farmers, also includes so-called professional profits, i.e. the incomes of lawyers, doctors, etc., and Schedules C and E, in which no details are given, include the incomes of civil servants, officers, state sinecurists, creditors of the state, etc. Under Schedule D, the average annual increase of income from 1853 to 64 was only 0.93% in Ireland, whereas in the same period in Great Britain it was 4.58%. Table E shows the distribution of the profits with the exception of those of the farmers for the years 1864 to 65. The aforementioned graphics cannot be read aloud for the recording. Please consult pages 855 to 859 of a physical or digital copy of the book for visual reference. England, a preeminently industrial country with fully developed capitalist production, would have bled to death under such a population drain as Ireland has suffered. But Ireland is at present merely an agricultural district of England which happens to be divided by a wide stretch of water from the country for which it provides corn, wool, cattle, and industrial and military recruits. The depopulation of Ireland has thrown much of the land out of cultivation, greatly diminished the produce of the soil, and in spite of the greater area devoted to cattle breeding, brought about an absolute decline in some of its branches, and in others an advance scarcely worth mentioning, and constantly interrupted by retrogressions. Nevertheless, the rents of the land and the profits of the farmers increased along with the fall in the population, though not so steadily as the latter. The reason for this will easily be understood. On the one hand, with the throwing together of small holdings and the change from arable to pasture land, a larger part of the total product was transformed into a surplus product. The surplus product increased, although there was a decrease in the total product of which the surplus formed a fraction. On the other hand, the monetary value of this surplus product increased still more rapidly than its actual quantity, owing to the rise in the price of meat, wool, etc. on the English market during the last 20 years, and especially during the last 10. The scattered means of production that serve the producers themselves as means of employment and subsistence, without valorizing themselves through the incorporation of the labor of others, are no more capital than a product consumed by its producer as a commodity. If the mass of the means of production employed in agriculture diminished along with the mass of the population, the mass of the capital employed in agriculture increased, because a part of the means of production that were formerly scattered was turned into capital. The total capital of Ireland outside agriculture, employed in industry and trade, accumulated only slowly during the last two decades, and with great and constantly recurring fluctuations. So much the more rapidly did the concentration of its individual constituents develop, and however small its absolute increase, its relative growth, in proportion to the diminishing population, was tremendous. Here, then, under our own eyes, and on a large scale, there emerges a process which perfectly corresponds to the requirements of orthodox economics for the confirmation of its dogma, the dogma that misery springs from an absolute surplus of population, and that equilibrium is re-established by depopulation. This is a far more important experiment than the mid-14th century plague so celebrated by the Malthusians. Let us remark in passing. If it required the naivete of a schoolmaster to apply the standard of the 14th century to the relations of production prevailing in the 19th century and the corresponding relations of population, the error was compounded by overlooking the difference between its consequences in England and in France. On this side of the channel, the plague and the decimation that accompanied it was followed by the enfranchisement and enrichment of the agricultural population whereas on the other side, in France, it was followed by a greater degree of enslavement and an increase in misery. The Irish famine of 1846 killed more than one million people, but it killed poor devils only. It did not do the slightest damage to the wealth of that country. The exodus of the next 20 years, an exodus which still continues to increase, did not, as for instance the Thirty Years' War did, decimate the means of production along with the human beings. The Irish genius discovered an altogether new way of spiriting a poor people thousands of miles away from the scene of its misery. The exiles transplanted to the United States send sums of money home every year as traveling expenses for those left behind. Every troop that emigrates one year draws another after it the next. Thus, instead of costing Ireland anything, emigration forms one of the most lucrative branches of its export trade. Finally, it is a systematic process, which does not simply make a passing gap in the population, but sucks out of it every year more people than are replaced by births, so that the absolute level of the population falls years by year. What were the consequences for the Irish laborers left behind and freed from the surplus population? These. The relative surplus population is as great today as it was before 1846. Wages are just as low. The oppression of the laborers has increased. Misery is forcing the country towards a new crisis. The reasons are simple. The revolution in agriculture has kept pace with emigration. 
The production of a relative surplus population has more than kept pace with the absolute depopulation. A glance at Table B will show that the change from arable to pasture land must work still more acutely in Ireland than in England. In England, the cultivation of green crops increases with the breeding of cattle. In Ireland, it decreases. While the large number of acres that were formerly tilled lie idle or are turned permanently into grassland, a great part of the wasteland and peat bogs that were formerly unused becomes of service for the extension of cattle breeding. The smaller and the medium farmers, I reckon among these all who do not cultivate more than a hundred acres, still make up about eight-tenths of the whole number. They are, one after the other, and with a degree of force unknown before, crushed by the competition of an agriculture managed by capital, and thus they continually furnish new recruits to the class of wage laborers. The one great industry of Ireland, the manufacture of linen, requires relatively few adult men, and only employs altogether, in spite of its expansion since the price of cotton increased in the years from 61 to 66, a comparatively insignificant portion of the population. Like all other large-scale industries, it constantly produces, owing to its incessant fluctuations, a relative surplus population within its own sphere despite the absolute increase in the mass of human beings being absorbed by it. The misery of the agricultural population forms the pedestal for gigantic shirt factories, whose armies of workers are, for the most part, scattered over the country. Here again we encounter the system of domestic industry already described, which possesses its own systematic means of rendering workers redundant in the form of underpayment and overwork. Finally, although the depopulation does not have such destructive consequences as would result in a country where capitalist production is fully developed, it does not proceed without constantly reacting back onto the home market. The gap caused by emigration limits not only the local demand for labor, but also the incomes of small shopkeepers, artisans, and tradesmen in general. Hence the decrease in incomes between 60 and 100 pounds indicated in Table E. A clear presentation of the condition of the agricultural laborers in Ireland is to be found in the reports of the Irish Poor Law Inspectors published in 1870. As officials of a government which is maintained only by bayonets and by a state of siege, sometimes open and sometimes disguised, they have to observe all the linguistic precautions their English colleagues disdain. In spite of this, however, they do not let their government cradle itself in illusions. According to them, the rate of wages in the country, still very low, has risen by 50 to 60 percent within the last 20 years, and stands now at an average of 6 shillings to 9 shillings a week. But this apparent rise hides an actual fall in wages, for it by no means cancels out the rise in the price of the necessary means of subsistence that has taken place in the meantime. The proof is the above extract from the official accounts of an Irish workhouse. The price of the necessary means of subsistence is thus approximately twice as high and the price of clothing exactly twice as high as 20 years before. Even if we leave aside this disproportion, a mere comparison of the rate of wages expressed in money would give a far from accurate result. Before the famine, the great mass of agricultural wages was paid in kind, and only the smallest part in money. Today, payment in money is the rule. It follows from this that whatever movement has taken place in the real wage, its money rate must have risen. Quote, Previous to the famine, the laborer enjoyed his cabin with a rood or half-acre or acre of land and facilities for a crop of potatoes. He was able to rear his pig and keep fowl. But they now have to buy bread, and they have no refuse upon which they can feed a pig or fowl, and they have consequently no benefit from the sale of a pig, fowl, or eggs. In fact, the agricultural laborers were formerly indistinguishable from the smallest of the small farmers, and they formed for the most part a kind of rear guard of the medium and large farms on which they found employment. Only since the catastrophe of 1846 have they begun to form a section of the class of pure wage laborers, a special estate which is now connected with its masters only by monetary relations. We know what their living conditions were in 1846. Since then they have grown still worse. Some of the agricultural day laborers, though their number grows smaller day by day, continue to live on the holdings of the farmers, in overcrowded huts whose hideousness far surpasses the worst examples the agricultural districts of England can offer and this holds generally, with the exception of certain tracts of Ulster. It holds in the south, in the counties of Cork, Limerick, Kilkenny, etc., in the east, in Wicklow, Wexford, etc., in the center, in Kings County, in Queens County, Dublin, etc., in the north, in Down and Antrim, in the west, in County Mayo, Galway, etc. Quote, the agricultural laborers' huts, an inspector cries out, are a disgrace to the Christianity and to the civilization of this country. To make these holes more attractive for the day laborers, the pieces of land which have belonged to them from time immemorial are systematically confiscated. The mere sense that they exist, subject to this species of ban, on the part of the landlords and their agents, has given birth in the minds of the laborers to corresponding sentiments of antagonism and dissatisfaction towards those by whom they are thus led to regard themselves as being treated as a prescribed race, 
The first act of the agricultural revolution was to sweep away the huts situated at the place of work. This was done on the largest scale, and as if in obedience to a command from on high. Thus many laborers were compelled to seek shelter in villages and towns. There they were thrown like refuse into garrets, holes, cellars, and corners, in the worst slum districts. Thousands of Irish families, who even on the testimony of the English, blinded as the latter are by nationalist prejudices, are notable for their rare attachment to the domestic hearth, for the gaiety and the purity of their home life, suddenly found themselves transplanted into hotbeds of vice. The men are now obliged to seek work from the neighboring farms, and are hired only by the day, and therefore under the most precarious form of wage. Hence, quote, they sometimes have long distances to go to and from work, often get wet, and suffer much hardship, not infrequently ending in sickness, disease, and want. The towns have had to receive from year to year what was deemed to be the surplus labor of the rural division. And then people still wonder that there is still a surplus of labor in the towns and villages, and either a scarcity or a threatened scarcity in some of the country divisions. The truth is that this scarcity only becomes perceptible in harvest time, or during spring, or at such times as agricultural operations are carried on with activity, at other periods of the year, many hands are idle. That from the digging out of the main crop of potatoes in October until the early spring following, there is no employment for them. And further, that during the active times, they are subject to broken days and to all kinds of interruptions. These results of the agricultural revolution, i.e. the change of arable into pasture land, the use of machinery, the economy of labor, etc., are still further aggravated by the model landlords who, instead of spending their rents in other countries, condescend to live in Ireland. In order that the law of supply and demand may not be infringed, these gentlemen draw their labor supply chiefly from their small tenants, who are obliged to attend when required to do the landlord's work, at the rate of wages in many instances considerably under the current rates paid to ordinary laborers, and without regard to the inconvenience or loss to the tenant of being obliged to neglect his own business at critical periods of sowing or reaping. The uncertainty and irregularity of employment, the constant return and long duration of gluts of labor, are all symptoms of a relative surplus population, and they therefore figure in the reports of the poor law inspectors as so many hardships suffered by the Irish agricultural proletariat. It'll be recalled that we met with similar phenomena among the English agricultural proletariat. But the difference is that in England, an industrial country, the industrial reserve is recruited from the countryside whereas in Ireland, an agricultural country, the agricultural reserve is recruited from the towns, the places of refuge of the agricultural laborers who have been driven from the land. In England, the surplus rural laborers are transformed into factory workers. In Ireland, those forced into the towns remain agricultural laborers even while they exert a downward pressure on urban wages and are constantly sent back to the countryside in search of work. The official inspectors sum up the material condition of the agricultural laborer as follows, quote, Though living with the strictest frugality, his own wages are barely sufficient to provide food for an ordinary family and pay his rent, and he depends upon other sources for the means of clothing himself, his wife, and his children. The atmosphere of these cabins, combined with the other privations they are subjected to, has made this class particularly susceptible to typhus and consumption. In view of this, it is no wonder that according to the unanimous testimony of the inspectors, a somber discontent runs through the ranks of this class, that they long for the return of the past, loathe the present, despair of the future, give themselves up to, quote, the evil influence of agitators, and have only one fixed idea, to emigrate to America. This is the land of cocaine, into which depopulation, the great Malthusian panacea, has transformed Green Erin. One example will be sufficient to show what a prosperous life is led by the Irish factory worker. On my recent visit to the north of Ireland, says the English factory inspector Robert Baker, I met with the following evidence of effort in an Irish skilled workman to afford education to his children, and I give his evidence verbatim as I took it from his mouth. That he was a skilled factory hand may be understood when I say that he was employed on goods for the Manchester market. Johnson said, I am a beetler and work from six in the morning till eleven at night, from Monday to Friday. Saturday we leave off at 6 p.m. and get three hours of it for meals and rest. I have five children in all. For this work I get ten shillings sixpence a week. My wife works here also and gets five shillings a week. The oldest girl, who is twelve, minds the house. She is also cook and all the servant we have. She gets the young ones ready for school. A girl going past the house wakes me up at half past five in the morning. My wife gets up and goes along with me. We get nothing to eat before we come to work. The child of twelve takes care of the little children all the day and we get nothing till breakfast at eight. At eight, we go home. We get tea once a week. At other times, we get stir-about, sometimes of an oatmeal, sometimes of Indian meal, as we are able to get it. In the winter, we get a little sugar and water to our Indian meal. In the summer, we get a few potatoes, planting a small patch ourselves, and when they are done, we get back to stir-about. Sometimes we get a little milk, as it may be, 
So we go on from day to day, Sunday and weekday, always the same year round. I'm always very much tired when I have done at night. We may see a bit of flesh meat sometimes, but very seldom. Three of our children attend school, for whom we pay one pence a week per head. Our rent is nine pence a week. Pete for firing costs one shilling sixpence a fortnight at the very lowest. Such are Irish wages. Such is Irish life. In fact, the misery of Ireland is once again a daily theme of discussion in England. At the end of 1866 and the beginning of 67, one of the Irish land magnates, Lord Dufferin, set about solving the problem in the Times. To quote Gotha, what humanity from such a great lord. We saw from Table E that during 1864, out of a total profit of £4.36 million, pounds, three money grubbers pocketed only 262610 and that in 1865, however, out of a total profit of £4.66 million, pounds, the same three virtuosos of abstinence pocketed 274528 In 1864, 26 money grubbers took £664,377, pounds, and 65, 28 took 736448 in 1864, 121 took 1.06 million pounds. In 1865, 186 took 1.32 million pounds. In 1864, 1,331 money grubbers took 2.15 million pounds, nearly half of the total annual profit. And in 1865, 1,194 took 2.41 million pounds, more than half of the total annual profit. But the lion's share of the yearly national rental, which an inconceivably small number of land magnates in England, Scotland, and Ireland swallow up, is so monstrous that English statesmanship finds it inappropriate to afford the same statistical materials about the distribution of rents as about the distribution of profits. Lord Dufferin is one of those land magnates. That rent rolls and profits can never be excessive, or that the plethora of rent rolls and profits is in any way connected with the plethora of popular miseries, is of course an idea as disreputable as it is unsound. Dufferin keeps to the facts. The fact is that as the Irish population diminishes, the Irish rent rolls swell. The depopulation benefits the landlords, thus also benefits the soil, and therefore the people, that mere accessory of the soil. He declares, therefore, that Ireland is still overpopulated, and the stream of emigration still flows too sluggishly. To be perfectly happy, Ireland must get rid of at least one-third of a million working men. Let no one imagine that this lord, who is also a poet, is a physician of the school of Sangrado, who, if he failed to find an improvement in the condition of his patient, ordered bloodletting after bloodletting until the patient lost his sickness when he had lost his blood. Lord Dufferin demands a new bloodletting of one-third of a million only, instead of about two millions, but in fact, unless these two millions are got rid of, the millennium cannot come to pass in Erin. The proof is easily given. Centralization has from 1851 to 1861 mainly destroyed farms of the first three categories, under one and not over 15 acres. This gives 307,058 surplus farmers, and reckoning a low average of four persons per family, 1.228 million persons. On the extravagant assumption that a quarter of these can again be absorbed after the completion of the agricultural revolution, there remains for the emigration 921,174 persons. Categories 4, 5, and 6, including farms of between 15 and 100 acres, are, as has long been known in England, too small for the capitalist cultivation of corn, and almost infinitesimal from the point of view of sheep breeding. On the same assumptions as before, therefore, there are a further 788,761 persons to emigrate. Grand total, 1.709 million. And, as appetite grows with eating, rent rolls eyes will soon discover that Ireland, with three and a half millions, still continues to be miserable. Miserable because she is overpopulated. Therefore, her deep population must go still further, in order that she may be able to fulfill her true destiny, to be an English sheep walk and cattle pasture. Like all good things in the world, this profitable mode of proceeding has its drawbacks. The accumulation of the Irish in America keeps pace with the accumulation of rents in Ireland. The Irishman, banished by the sheep and the ox, reappears on the other side of the ocean as a Fanian. And there, a young but gigantic republic rises, more and more threateningly, to face the old queen of the waves. A cruel fate torments the Romans, and the crime of fratricide. End of Part 7